we can start now. Um, welcome to all of you. I'm pleased to uh, welcome you on behalf of the uh, Trapoco teams members uh, from the University of Belgrade. And uh, this policy event, uh, as you know, is dedicated to the issue of civil society, political contention, and European enlargement. And uh, somehow we put a special emphasis uh, on uh, actually EU accession process and mechanism that it offers to the um, candidate countries uh, in terms of uh, opportunities uh, open to civil society uh, organizations uh, um, uh, that uh, um, to to address actually the e e EU institutions and to express or to present their problems and uh, uh, and obstacles they face with uh, during their work here in uh, Serbia. Uh, the event is organized within the two projects. Uh, the one is a transnational political contention in Europe, abbreviated TRAPOCO. And the other one is the project on climate change, environmental risks, and social mobilization in the Western Balkans. On both projects, our partner organizations are coming from Italy, and I will try to um, read their names, Osservatorio, Balcani, e Caucaso Trans Europa. Uh, it is a partner on both projects, and the Centro Studi di Politica Internazionale. It's our partner on the second project. Uh, Regarding both the topic of our policy event and uh, um, our uh, partner organizations, I'm pleased uh, to uh, say that we have uh, uh, today with us uh, Mr. Ekmel Cizmejioglu uh, from European Union delegation. He is a program manager for civil society and human rights, and also Mr. Lu Luca Gori, Italian ambassador. Uh, they will address us, and uh, please, Mr. Uh, Cismetioglu, can you take the floor first? Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Petrovic, uh, Mr. Ambassador, uh, valuable members of academia, uh, ex-members of civil society who probably remain members of civil society forever, um, and uh, dear participants, uh, good morning to you all. And welcome at uh, this early hour of the uh, the morning. Uh, it's very uh, nice to see all of you here. Um, now, well, uh, the topic is actually uh, is mainly on civil society, but uh, in the context of enlargement. So I definitely would like to start with um, um, making a few uh, comments on the recent impetus uh, regarding uh, enlargement, just to recall that the the first intergovernmental conferences uh, with Albania and North Macedonia and the uh, granting of the status candidate for uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina uh, are signals uh, that uh, really, I think, show that the future of uh, Western Balkans uh, is in the EU. Um, the Trana Declaration of the 6th of December illustrates the dynamics and the opportunities uh, stemming from the current momentum. As uh, most of you are well aware, uh, Ukraine and Moldova were also granted a candidate status, and uh, Georgia's uh, European perspective was also recognized by the European Council last June. Now, um, well, democracy is at the core of the European values, and uh, we believe that civil society is a very important uh, player uh, in this, and they uh, they are main role is not only uh, monitoring or, uh, you know, like advocating for things, but by doing so, they become the voice of the citizens. And becoming a voice of citizen is very important. Why is it important in a democratic uh, society? Because it allows the citizens to feel that they have a control and they have a say about the future, their own future, and what they can do uh, in their own countries. Um, it allows the citizens to be active. Uh, civil society gives them the space uh, to do that. Now, how do we uh, look at the uh, the health of the civil society uh, in the country? Um, some of you might be aware that there is the EU guidelines for civil society that look at three important uh, factors. Uh, these are mainly about the uh, enabling environment for civil society, the uh, dialogue between civil society and the uh, authorities, and the resilience and capacity building opportunities for civil society. These are the three specific objectives. 
And um, as the EU, uh, what we do is we try to follow up the, the situation. Uh, and we have actually a specific project, uh, TAXO, the Technical Assistance for Civil Society Organizations, uh, that are actually, uh, that have a new mandate and they will be following the indicators about the situation and we'll, we'll report to it and which we will also of course share uh, with the public as we get this kind of information uh, which we believe is very important to demonstrate and show and follow database in a database manner the situation of civil society in the country um, the recently adopted government strategy is also a positive uh, step forward and uh, we are glad to see that uh, the implementation of the strategy is or has already started and there is a specific focus on the establishment of the Council for Civil Society. And this, uh, we really look forward to the establishment. We have always included this in the annual reports of the, of the EU uh, for Serbia. And uh, we believe that civil society uh, will also be happy at the end uh, with, the, with the end result. Now, today, uh, we will also hear about an interesting policy paper uh, that is titled, I understand, uh, Environmental Initiatives in uh, Serbia and Their European Perspective. Of course, environmental and climate issues are, are not new, neither in Serbia nor in the EU. Um, what is different today in this, in this period, I guess, is the uh, growing awareness of the citizens and the people, you know, the society about these issues and what kind of impact they have uh, in the future also of the societies, not only in terms of health, but in terms of, you know, a, a big uh, uh, number of factors. Now, I would like to just share three statistics. Uh, and if you allow me, I will read this from the Eurobarometer, uh, which show the importance that the society actually gives uh, to these matters. In uh, July 2021, Eurobarometer showed that 93% of the people surveyed in the EU member states consider climate change to be a serious problem. And 78% actually were considering it to be a very serious problem. Now, also more interesting is that in the Eurobarometer of June 2022, 89% of the respondents said that EU support to tackle climate change in partner countries like Serbia is important. And this demonstrates clear support for the EU's Green Deal, which underpins its work, I think, inside the EU and with partner countries. Now, when we come to Serbia, a survey in 2022 showed that 56% of respondents believe that climate change is a problem for humankind and 62 percent of citizens were not satisfied with the way problems are tackled to improve the environment in serbia i think these are very important to 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 understand to note and to quote them as well you know when when appropriate because this really shows the raising awareness in the society about the environmental and climate change related problems now, of course, we are, we are all aware of the issues, you know, there are issues about air, water and soil pollution, uh, unsustainable urbanism, uh, polluting industries, you know, in particular, the ones linked to energy and mining as well. But uh, also, we see that there is a lot of effort to question, to monitor what is happening and to challenge as well, uh, again, when appropriate. So, um, as the EU, we support uh, the Serbian people, of course, in their struggle for a healthy environment. And uh, we surely encourage Serbia on its path to alignment with the EU acquis and environmental standards. Um, I think something that's very important is pollution and climate change knows no borders. And we can only address this together what some call the biggest challenge of on uh, humankind. Now, um, as uh, Ms. Petrovic mentioned at the beginning, I also would like to shortly uh, refer to uh, the support that uh, the EU is providing to uh, civil society in terms of programs and, uh, and the financial uh, support that we provide. 
Um, we have two major programs, uh, as you might know, it is the civil society facility and the human rights and democracy programs, which is the previous EIDHR. Um, we do have an important amount that we, owe, we per annually we, uh, we provide uh, to civil society organizations. Uh, we always, of course, consult. We have regular consultations where we invite civil society organizations, academia, uh, and other partners uh, for to do before we do the programming. And uh, I think uh, what is relevant today, especially, is uh, in the past three years, three to four years, we have been as the EU, we have been allocating significant amount of fund funding for projects that allow financial support to third parties. Financial support to third parties means, you know, we have a civil society organization that assists us in distributing support, but not only money, but they also, they mentor these small organizations in the rural areas or informal groups even get support from such projects. Uh, they mentor these partner organizations that we have, for example, like you know, Belgrade Open School, uh, NKD, Truck Foundations, et cetera. I'm not gonna name all of them, but we do have many partners. They support these small organizations and informal groups to become the voice of citizens all across Serbia. No matter what they, you know, what they're interested, you know, their their local agendas come uh, come, let's say they get to get a voice. Um, well, to conclude, uh, I would like to reiterate that the EU is uh, fully committed uh, to the EU integration of Serbia and the Western Balkans. EU support to Serbia and to the region is genuine and envisions our shared future in our European continent. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cizma Gjelglu, I'm sorry. Uh, thank you for this supportive and informative speech, so to say. And now I'm uh, um, I give a word to Mr. Ambassador Gori. Thank you very much uh, to you, to all the organizers of this uh, uh, important event. Uh, uh, thank you very much for the invitation to be here. Very happy to to share some views from the Italian perspective with regard um, to enlargement uh, and also the role of civil society. I would start by saying that uh, uh, when civil society is strong, democracy, as we all know, is, uh, is stronger. And uh, the role of, cis of civil society uh, remains uh, crucial, uh, not only in Serbia, not only in the Western Balkan, in order to strengthen transparency and um, accountability of public authorities, and of course, in order to promote active engagement of the citizens with their communities uh, for uh, inclusive uh, processes in, uh, in all the societies. And uh, uh, we are, as uh, the Italian Embassy in Belgrade, we are uh, contributing to implement projects in Serbia with uh, civil societies, civil society in uh, different uh, areas, uh, consolidation of democratic institution, support to national and regional reconciliation, promotion of EU integration, reform of justice, fight against corruption, inclusion of uh, uh, youth, women, LGBTQ plus communities and national minorities. The role of civil society is also crucial, of course, uh, in, uh, in uh, respect to, to the enlargement process. Uh, I think in particular, the civil society in Serbia is a key in order to push the authorities to advance uh, the reform agenda uh, in order to be integrated in the, in the European Union. But I think the civil society is also, has also a critical role to rebuild, uh, I would say, a new consensus with regard to the enlargement process in Serbia and also in the Balkan region. I think we need uh, a new positive agenda uh, with regard to the European Union. We need a more positive uh, narrative in this country vis-a-vis -vis the European Union. And uh, we need a sort of new coalition 
of uh, not only civil society, but political parties, uh, media, uh, young generations, business uh, people, there is the need really to, to try to have uh, a new consensus, uh, a new positive agenda with regard to the enlargement uh, uh, process. Uh, in other words, we need to find a way to create a new momentum uh, with regard to the enlargement process. Of course, uh, uh, we know that uh, we have granted the candidate status to Bosnia and Herzegovina. We have started uh, the process, uh, the, the accession uh, uh, negotiation with Albania and North Macedonia. But uh, from our perspective, this is not enough. Uh, this is not enough because the process remains uh, very, very slow and we have to, to accelerate it. How? And this is, of course, uh, the most difficult uh, thing. Um, uh, of course, uh, I see, especially for Serbia, uh, four main tracks that uh, should be pursued in order to accelerate the process. First of all, of course, uh, to speed up uh, the reform agenda, this is obvious. And uh, uh, Serbia uh, did progresses, uh, even important progresses in the last months, for instance, with regard to the justice reform, but of course there is still a, a long way to go. Uh, the second point uh, that could uh, help to facilitate the enlargement process is of course a normalization with Kosovo. Uh, we saw an important meeting in, in Brussels uh, last, last Monday. Uh, some progresses were made, but there is still a lot of work to do in order to implement what was agreed. And in particular, I think the key issue now is the implementation of, of the Association of Serb Municipalities that we believe should be realized as soon as possible. Uh, the third element uh, is, uh, I would say, a more constructive relationship with uh, Croatia. Uh, a more constructive relationship between Serbia and Croatia, I think, will facilitate the process of enlargement also to Serbia in the future. We saw some uh, uh, encouraging progresses in the last months. Uh, they restarted a dialogue, which is very important, with some uh, visits meetings and uh, we think this is a very important uh, dossier to be uh, pursued with uh, uh, with uh, determination and the four uh, point that is i think very important today if uh, serbia want to see uh, a speeder process of enlargement is of course uh, the alignment with uh, EU foreign policy, the alignment with the CFSP with regard to, to the Ukraine conflict. Because the, the, the European Union is not just a question of a key, it's also a question of ethos. So it's, it's also a question of values. And uh, today we have a conflict in Europe and uh, the alignment with the European Union position vis-a-vis -vis Russia, I think it's a very important uh, point. Uh, uh, looking at the future, I see three possible scenarios for, for the enlargement process. Uh, the first scenario is a sort of business as usual scenario. So a scenario where we will continue to make uh, slow progresses uh, towards uh, the European integration, a sort of uh, uh, scenario where fatalism is a little bit uh, uh, the kind of atmosphere in where we work in the sense that uh, we will continue to, uh, as I said, a little bit the business as usual to make uh, uh, small steps uh, in a very long process uh, without uh, uh, seeing the, 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 the final step uh, in sight. The second scenario, possible scenario would be a sort of uh, geopolitical acceleration due to the Ukraine situation. We all know that Ukraine today has a candidate status. 
uh, we could expect in the in the next couple of years uh, some uh, uh, progresses uh, with regard to Ukraine and. Uh, from our perspective, it would be important for the Western Balkans not to be excluded from a possible acceleration in geopolitical terms uh, with regard to the enlargement to Ukraine. And the third scenario is a scenario where we could uh, at least assess new ideas to try to see if we can set a sort of intermediate step we, with the countries uh, of the region to try to revamp a little bit uh, the, the enlargement process. Uh, civil society organizations have provided many different ideas. For instance, there is the idea of a staged accession. There is the idea of try to concentrate all the efforts on the accession uh, to the single market. Of course, uh, these are ideas uh, that have pro and contra. Sometimes uh, these are ideas are very difficult to realize, but of course, I think it's worthwhile to discuss them and to try to understand if they can really help to, to create a new momentum with regard to the enlargement. Uh, and uh, as I said, uh, at least from the Italian perspective, uh, uh, it is important uh, to uh, accelerate this process in particular, also in view of the geopolitical situation we have in Europe uh, uh, today. Because uh, if we say on one side that the enlargement process is the most important instrument we have to try also to balance the influence in the region of other international players, then we have to, on the other side, we have to be consistent and to try to use this instrument and to make it uh, uh, working in a faster uh, way. So this is uh, at least uh, the vision of Italy. We, we have, as you know, a new government that has decided to re-engage uh, fully in the Balkans. Uh, we had a very important uh, conference in Trieste uh, three weeks ago where all the, as we call it, Sistema Italia was present and uh, uh, the message was was very clear for for all the Italian uh, system to re-engage uh, in the Balkans and in the region. In particular, we will have uh, in Serbia on the 21st of March a very important business and science forum. Uh, we have already more than 140 Italian companies registered to come to Belgrade. So this is going to be a very important event. Uh, to show that uh, there is uh, interest in uh, uh, forging partnerships with Serbia in view of the enlargement process, uh, in view of uh, uh, a common efforts to try to integrate the region into the European Union. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Gori. Thank you for this short but thorough review of um problems and the challenges of uh, European integration and enlargement uh, processes and um, somehow encouraging messages uh, to Serbian accession. Um, thank you both for your um, speech. And now with this, we actually end this kind of uh, opening ceremony of this event. And um, we can actually move on uh, um, to our working part. And according to our agenda, we will work uh, through two panels. The first one is titled Building Europe from Below, Social Movements and Civil Society Organizations, while the uh, following panel will deal with issues of climate changes, environmental risks, and social mobilization in the Western Balkans. Finally, I would like to thank uh, Belgrade University for making uh, this hall available for us today. And um, I... Once again, thank you all for coming and taking part in this policy event. Hope that the, our work will be efficient and successful. And I hope that you will enjoy your stay at the University of Belgrade. Thank you. So we will change. Mm -hmm.
Shall we get started? Yes, 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 yes. Sorry, sorry. Okay, <clears throat> welcome to the first panel on uh, building Europe from below social movements and civil society organizations. My name is Philip Edus, and I will be the moderator of, of this panel. And since we have um, quite a few participants, um, instead of introducing them all at the very beginning, uh, we have decided to introduce first our two initial kind of speakers, and then I will uh, move on to the introduction of, of discussants. So we will kick off this panel with the presentation of the uh, Transnational Political Contention in Europe uh, project, Dr. Aaron Buzogani from the University of Natural Resources and Life Sciences, uh, Vienna, Austria. And then we will have a presentation of the joint uh, policy document um, by Dr. Jelena Pesic from the Faculty of Philosophy, which she co-authored with uh, Jelisaveta Petrovic from the same university. Without any further ado, Dr. Buzogani, the floor is yours. Thank you, Philip. Um, and I have a presentation somewhere, which I, yeah, which is here. Just stay. Um, so thank you for for coming. Uh, thank you for offering the, this hall to us. Thank you for making possibilities for meeting. Um, for example, with Philip, uh, we worked together for quite some years, but we never met. And this is the first time uh, we, we, we meet really in person. This was not only because of, uh, uh, of, of, of the pandemic, but uh, also of, because of regional um, distances. Um, and what my task is here to present the, this project, uh, which made this possible, uh, this, uh, these meetings. And this is a project called Transnational Political Contention in Europe. Um, and it brings some of you here and it makes uh, opportunities for meeting. Um, and it's made already uh, for two years, um, these meetings po possible. And it made, in a sense, at least research on transnational political contention in Europe um, possible. So, um, so what is, uh, now it switches back, okay. Um, so what is this trapoco? Um, um, you know, the Italian word for it, so it's a, it's a bit of it, but it's actually quite a lot in this, this project. So it's, a, it's about um, transnational political action. Um, it's very officially, it's a Jean Monnet network um, and the Erasmus Plus, Plus program. And it go, its goal is to promote awareness, innovate in teaching, encourage dialogue between academia and civil society, um, and partic look particularly um, at studies relating to uh, European integration. So this is also one event uh, of, of, of this, and this is also what we are, what we're doing here. And who are we? Um, this is, you can see, uh, below, uh, there are, I will talk more with detail about these partners. Uh, the project is led by Scuola Normale Superiore in Firenze, um, and, and then there is University College Dublin, um, University of Belgrade, of course, uh, my university, University of Bodenkultur, um, and um, the University of Trento, which is an associate partner. And then we uh, also work together with, with Good Lobby. And for some reason, uh, we don't have here the logo of those who are really the masterminds behind this, um, uh, Osservatorio Balcani uh, 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 So, but maybe because they were so shy to put it, and I just took this picture. Um, so as I said, there are three goals, uh, what we do in this, this project. So it's a, it's a joint, basically we establish the joint research program on the role of, of transnational activism. Um, and we look at, at strengthening the space of democracy and rights in Europe. Um, it's about teaching. Teaching means there is an exchange there will be, uh, of, of, uh, of teachers, of, uh, of professors who are um, basically going from one university to the other and uh, telling telling students in the other universities about their methods their findings um and and there is there are events like this uh which is a dialogue with society so this, this could be seminars workshops public events um for an ongoing dialogue so the idea is 
very strongly here that we shouldn't stay in the academia in the ivory towers of academia but go out and um and and, and also engage with with real issues um, with uh, with policymakers and basically the idea which was uh, said before by the by the two uh, um, official representatives here is that exactly what they were saying that to engage and hear uh, and bring civil society together uh, with those who are um, on the policy making side. So. Um, Maybe one short point about why this project um, was initiated, and um, it's, it's running already like more than two years, um, and in a sense, the science which we, which were leading to the initiation of this project um, are not getting lesser. So. As you're probably all aware, the this idea of a liberal world order, which includes representative democracy, multilateralism, um, and basically also peace um, are in being increasingly uh, questioned. Uh, the war in, the, in Ukraine being one of probably the, the biggest blasts of this disorder. And some of these dynamics are obviously undermining uh, the EU's uh, constituent, uh, constituent values as well. Um, as the ambassador said before, the EU is, is not ab only about the Aki, but it's also about values and ethos. Um, and this is, of course, why, why the EU is funding such uh, uh, such projects because they they think that this civil society might be uh, might act in, in in as a democratic as a guarantee uh, uh, both at the EU level and also in the uh, member states or those who who are aspiring to join it and we had a lot of um, demand basically from from civil society or also from simply from the street there were major mobilizations in the last three to three to four years. Um, in all kinds of directions. Fridays for Future is one uh, one aspect. Um, Black Lives Matter, uh, protest against racial discrimination, which was not only in the US, uh, but also in most of Western Europe. Um, then also against the war in some countries, for for on one part, on the other, more on on, uh, on the other, uh, but also um, protest for or against pandemic restrictions. So we have a lot which, which is happening on the, on the street. Um, and and we, we see complex transformations in, the so in our societies um, in, in all kinds of complex issues related to jobs, environment, climate, health, redistribution, and so on. So what Trapoco aims to do is to, to, to look at, in an, in, look at how, how these actors are engaging, can engage in, a, in collective actions, both nationally, but also in a, at a, a transnational level. So how the EU being a supranational entity, how can it be matched by also by connecting civil societies in, in, in different countries, not only in the EU, but also beyond that. And what we, what we think of, uh, this is more theoretic of what, how this transnationalization of civil society of social movements um, might happen. So it, we think that this this can happen um, along several ways. It, it's all about the diffusion of ideas, uh, but it's also a domestication adoption of international goals. Could be also EU policies in, for example, in Serbia. Um, it could be also externalization. Uh, so addressing international actors with the intention of influencing national governments. So this is this, this so-called boomerang moment when when civil society in maybe some some regional uh, uh, in, in some region of, of of Serbia is calling uh, upon the EU to help to to achieve its goals. Think of we will hear about this more in the in the afternoon. Um, and then it's also simply about transnationalization in a narrow sense when organizations, civil society groups are um, getting together um, across the borders to act together. So this is this is how we can think of this conceptually um, and we have all these aspects in the in the project and we combine very different disciplinary pr perspectives. all the uh, um, the participants um, are for a lot, many many are working in social movement studies, but they're, they're different fields of social science research, which is included here. There are some political theor theoreticians, 
Others look more at public policy or they come from labor studies or migration research. And there is also a strong track of people who are interested in transnational issues, international relations and EU studies. Um, and basically, what are the topics of, of Trapoco? Are, these are just very briefly, and I will show afterwards the, the, the homepage where you can get more information about what we really did. Uh, but they are essentially, there are four groups of uh, of, of topics uh, uh, where we look at. It's about migration and questions of transnational solidarity. It's about uh, transnational labor struggles. This is these are the colleagues from Dublin who look at, for example, what happens what happens in the for the Ryanair pilots? How do they organize? How do how, how can Ryanair pilots, whom you have here seeing uh, uh, around it, um, above Belgrade? Uh, what happens if they if they have a labor strike? We usually see the, what the effects of that, uh, but it's also a, a question of transnational labor mobilization, and this is what uh, what the colleagues from Dublin are working on. Uh, we we have um, a group which is here in Belgrade uh, working on environmental protests. As you know, this is these are the years of environmental protests in in uh, um, in, in, in Serbia and the region. And we work also, and this is my uh, my group, we work on climate mobilization. So basically very much related to the environmental mobilization, but but also what has happened, who are those uh, who are mobilizing and, uh, and with, uh, Fridays for Future? Uh, what do they think about the future? Um, and how do they interconnect uh, across countries? These are some of the examples which we uh, have published um, or colleagues have published. Uh, for example, the, the colleagues from Dublin have looked at, at uh, how labor alliances succeed or not succeed across Europe. Um, uh, the, the, the Serbian colleagues have, have looked, for example, at um, movements against small hydropower uh, in, in, in Serbia. And Italian colleagues looked at, 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 uh, at the, the Italian solidarity movements towards the Western Balkans. Um, um, and um, me with a colleague, we looked, for example, at political ecology and environmentalism in Eastern Europe. Um, and this is a, um, a special issue where Philip has also contributed a piece on Belgrade um, and, uh, um, and, and the Belgrade protests. So these are only some examples. Um, and I want to finish with, with two, uh, two findings, which might be maybe interesting um, for, for also for, for the discussion today. Um, there are, of course, many more findings, uh, but I just took, uh, took took two out because I think they, they might talk to some of the, um, uh, the the topics which we will address in the in the next hours. The one is the first is is basically the question of whether if you look at civil society, if you talk about civil society, whether we talk about real grassroots movements or are we talk about astroturf? Astroturf being, you know, the uh, this artificial grass, um, um, which which some have in their gardens because it's much easier to uh, to water. You don't have to water it, basically. Um, and and the, there was basically the the discussion in in in, in uh, which we had also in 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 the context of our project whether how does external uh, funding um, affect um, civil society organizations? So whether external funding makes civil society organizations lose their grassroots. So do they become astroturf if they get um, if they if they are get if they get donor dependent, and and of course there is also this discussion uh, which we also had here in this context is whether there is something like a Matthew effect uh, among civil society and also related to donors. Matthew effect being. That is the Bible. Um, so those who, for unto everyone that had shall be given, the basically meaning that those who have will have even more. Um, and this this affects maybe some. I see some of you nodding. Um, well, I mean, this is a fact. This is also a game played or an, an effect which is there in civil society. Um, and then, but this is also only one side. You know? So there, there, there is also discursive power. It's not all about res resources. So. But we see there are more and more organizations which basically work on, on with no resources really. So there was this discussion about professionalization uh, in civil in the civil society realm. But more and more we see that there are 
effect, very effective organizations which uh, work with, with on relatively low budget, but they they are still very effective to to change discourses and they or or to um, um, reach their aims with very different um, uh, means. Second point is um, is related to the EU, which is also somehow here in the in in, in the room um, because we we all have have some ideas about it, um, and what what emerged from the several projects, and you see they are very different, is that basically the EU is a very dual, very very ambivalent uh, player in this field. So of course it it does what uh, um, uh, what. what um, uh, the head of uh, the delegation was saying before, so it's a fr good friend of civil society, and it's pro promoting all kinds of, of good things. But of course, at the same time, it has a dual agenda. So it has a, a agenda of market building, but it also of some kind of society building, but the building of a society of a very certain kind. And we often see ambivalent EU norms. So it, on the one hand, they uh, so think of, of those those norms which are about market liberalization, but also think about those which are equally equal EU norms, which are about, for example, nature protection. Um, so they we have very often these clashes of this uh, of these norms, and and civil society is feeling these clashes very strongly, um, and has has to um, um, has to play somehow uh, with with these. Uh, two roles. Um, so this is just some glimpses, uh, really, on, on, on what, what we do in this, uh, with all these partners. And uh, I tried now to pick out two things. If you were interested in this, or I hope you got a bit interested in what, what we did, uh, you can find uh, more out on the homepage of Balkani Caucaso, who is basically the, really the, uh, the backbone of the project in terms of information provision and, uh, and 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 so on. So you can go there and find out more about us. But this is basically what uh, uh, what I wanted to to share with you on what Trapoco really is. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor um, Buzogani, for this <clears throat> presentation of the project. And now we will move on to the presentation of uh, actually one of the you know fruits of the project we'll see i think in the best possible way uh, the, one of the outcomes or outputs of, of the project which is a policy paper co-authored by dr pesic and dr petrovic exactly on the relationship between the european integration civil society mobilization relationships between professional and grassroots and many, many other topics and some very useful recommendations for the EU. So Dr. Pesic, the floor is yours. Thank you, Philip. And thank you all. I, I would like to welcome you all and to thank you for being for coming here, here and for being willing to participate in this dialogue on the possibilities of uh, building sustainable civil society, not only in Serbia, but also in region. So I will try to reflect upon some of the findings of the Tripoco project and uh, the research that the University of Belgrade team has done. As we said, we have focused our uh, research on exploration of environmental movements in Serbia, especially grassroots environmental initiatives. And just to be, uh, just to quickly, quick, quickly mention that the University of Belgrade team is consisted of uh, Dr. Elisaveta Vokilic Petrovic, Dr. Mina Petrovic, and myself. And approaching these final stages of the project, we have done two research studies, you can see them. And of course, the third one is uh, on its way. But uh, given that this is a policy event, I will try to uh, uh, present some of the policy, policy recommendations that we will uh, present to members of the European Parliament in June in Brussels. So I would like to get your inputs, maybe uh, if you have some uh, good uh, good uh, examples, what, 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 what else should be recommended to the policymakers in Brussels. So just uh, briefly, I will, uh, before I uh, come to recommendations, I will briefly go to, uh, through some of the um, research findings from our uh, survey. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to point out several challenges that uh, uh, invoked or that contributed to the rise of environmental movement in Serbia in recent years after the year 2000. And I will single out uh, four factors. Uh, the first one is influx of foreign uh, capital and consolidation of domestic capital, who saw the opportunity to gain profit on the expense of porous implementation of environmental laws in Serbia. 
Secondly, this poor implementation of environmental protection standards enabled import of dirty technologies and uh, created new potentials for new potential causes of uh, ecological hazards. Thirdly, more recently, we have seen that natural resources also became new lucrative sources for capitalist accumulation by dispossession. And finally, the lack of transparency and accountability in implementation of different projects and laws also resulted in uh, this kind of uh, uh, potential hazards and uh, degradation of nature. Uh, also, there were some um, incentives for development of environmental movement which were coming from the EU accession process, and I will single out a uh, few of them. First of all, EU accession process brought about external demands toward harmonization of local legislation with Euro European standards and law implementation of European policies. And this contributed very much to the fact that environmental issues became uh, present in public dis discourse, which was not really the case in earlier uh, uh, years. And we can say that EU accession process somehow sparked the creation of green public sphere in Serbia. Secondly, the EU supported the establishment of environmental uh, civil sector by raising capacities and by provi providing material, technical, educational, and other resources to building uh, and establishment of uh, especially professional uh, non-government organizations which were operating in this area of environmental protection. And finally, finally, EU, EU uh, fostered a partnership between civil sector organizations and the state and promoted the establishment of participatory environmental governance. Now, having said what were the incentives, I have to say that there were also some obstacles in uh, uh, achieving these goals. First of all, adopted uh, uh, EU envir environmental laws and policies were implemented selectively, while control mechanisms were not really uh, uh, completely put in place. Secondly, implementation of EU-supported green policies, such as energy transition, in situation of such porous implementation of environmental laws and lack of accountability, uh, somehow brought to life this contradictory effect of uh, EU green policies and potential irreparable consequences they could leave on nature and communities. Thirdly, selective support of EU and donors toward professional NGOs on the expense of grassroots initiatives led to the creation of a symmetrical structure of uh, environmental movement. And as a result of that, much of the criticism uh, towards professional NGOs came from grassroots organizations uh, as uh, uh, being ineffective, non-authentic, and for depoliticizing environmental struggles. And finally, although EU stimulated mechanisms of citizen participation in decision-making processes, these mechanisms were not fully developed, not, not in this area at least. So we have now unresponsive uh, institutions to citizens' demands and closed channels for uh, institutional resolution of environmental disputes, which is leading to the rise of uh, street politics and radicalization of environmental initiatives. Now let me tell me let let me just reflect something uh, about grassroots uh, environmental initiatives in Serbia. First of all, they started to flourish and emerge uh, after the consequences of the economic economic crisis hit Serbia severely with the implementation of a number of uh, austerity policies, and we have seen a multitude of initiatives uh, and protests of various groups which were hit by these austerity measures. And sometimes these initiatives are actually coupled with broader expression of discontent against democratic backsliding and grooving authoritarian tendencies within this country. So by using this favorable political opportunity structure, environmental grassroots initiatives also started to flourish. And at first, these were mostly urban initiatives of middle classes uh, fighting against decreasing quality of life uh, in urban areas uh, caused by air pollution or water pollution or by chemical hazards. But what are, what, what are we seeing in the recent years, and that is something new, is that uh, we have emergence of uh, environmentalism of marginalized resource-deprived communities in rural areas against the projects which are projects that, that actually are products of commodification and neoliberalization of nature and destruction of their immediate livelihood. So we are calling this environmentalism of the poor or environmentalism of dispossessed. Some of those local initiatives by using, as I said, favorable political opportunity structure and anti-government marches managed to massively mobilize citizens, scale up their discontent at national level, uh, and even urge political parties to focus their programs on environmental issues. Also, we have seen some elements of transnationalization as well. 
In the case of initiatives against small hydropower plants, agents of transnationalization were mostly local professional organizations and expert who, experts who advocated very much against piping of the rivers. But also there was a significant help coming from international NGOs which were specialized in river protection and they were offering their uh, 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 help in, uh, in initiating joint, joint uh, actions targeting EU institutions and mobilizing EU public opinion, but also provided expert knowledge on detrimental consequences of the, uh, uh, of the building of small hydros. And in this respect, I can say that uh, uh, these initiatives had a uh, large potential for transnationalization, given that it was not a problem which was solely uh, solely related to Serbia, but it was a problem that sh uh, that shares a number of that share number of countries in the whole Western Balkan region. So this support of uh, international advocacy network was already there and already built. In the case of initiative against lithium exploitation, Rio Tinto, there were also some uh, elements of transnationalization of these struggles, but not as uh, uh, not as in the case of small hydros. Uh, first of all, uh, we have this thing that uh, it was a, a, a issue which is solely related to Serbia, not a regional issue. And secondly, although there was some kind of support coming from international advocacy networks, there were no uh, uh, there were no large campaigns which were uh, 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 as in the case of small hydras which were launched by international NGOs, so that uh, uh, local activists actually had to rely on their own forces to internationalize this question. And what happened is that they. Uh, started to seek contacts and to uh, try to establish uh, relations with organizations and networks which are not operating only in Europe, but operating beyond European context, uh, and that are most of the time critical of EU policies. So uh, what are the current challenges for development of uh, uh, grassroots initiatives? I would say that these are the common ones. So they're chronically lacking material, technical, organizational, and other support. So they have to rely on volunteer, volunteer effort of their uh, activists and sometimes to seek uh, uh, help from professional NGOs or from wider community, sometimes even from political parties. Although we have seen some cooperation between grassroots and uh, professional uh, NGOs, we have also seen that mistrust develops between them. So grassroots activists sometimes are afraid of not being heard enough or that NGOs will hijack their struggles, while professional NGOs, on the other hand, sometimes think that grassroots organizations are lacking expert expertise or professionalism. And much of this uh, mistrust is actually related to negative media representation of professional NGOs and their uh, delegitimization, which is coming uh, from political elites. So uh, what is novelty in this new uh, novel uh, environmental struggles is discursive framing of these uh, struggles. And it is increasingly becoming anti-colonialist, anti-imperialist, even anti-capitalist, set against extractivist agendas of multinational corporations, political and economic elites, and even some supra supranational bodies, including some uh, sometimes and European Union. So this critical stance toward, towards EU is not uh, as uh, 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 is not really emblematic for the of activists coming from professional NGOs because they see EU as potential ally and as a driver of civil society, but it is very much uh, present uh, uh, among grassroots activists uh, who are critical toward the uh, the EU uh, supported policies and EU supported projects. So now we're coming to recommendations. I can say that EU has already done a lot uh, in providing support to the development of the civil sector and, uh, for different initiatives. And we have uh, heard something about it uh, by Mr. Cizmechoglu. Uh, however, I still think that there is, uh, uh, that EU uh, has an important role to play in supporting uh, effective environmental movement in Serbia. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. So I will try to, uh, uh, to classify several uh, recommendations, which are mostly going to uh, addressing the EU uh, actions. First of all, a lot, as I said, uh, EU has already done a lot, and we can say that uh, some of these recommendations are actually targeting continuation of the already established policies. Uh, so EU should continue to provide funding, training, technical assistance to local NGOs, to promote transparency and accountability of the government and its agencies, to support implementation of existing and development of new environmental policies, to foster organization to develop expertise and propose evidence-based policies, 
and to work on promotion of participatory government by encouraging deliberative procedures and consultations of local authorities, government agencies with different stakeholders who are uh, interested in different uh, uh, environmental policies. Also, I would uh, argue that the EU should facilitate partnership between grassroots and professional organizations by launching calls who would specifically target joint initiatives and collaborative projects, but also to promote collaborative projects between transnational organizations and local organizations, and maybe most importantly, to uh, encourage cross-border cooperation between professional and grassroots organizations operating in the region who share the same concerns about environmental uh, degradation. And finally, in order to build citizens' trust towards the institutions of the Union, the EU should maybe initiate the establishment of a platform for ongoing dialogue and interaction between various stakeholders and representatives of European Union in order to uh, overcome is issues or disputes, especially when it comes to projects uh, and policies which are supported by the EU. And finally, finally, uh, maybe uh, EU should invest even additional effort in informing citizens and local communities about different mechanisms the Union is offering to accession countries and to enable them to be more actively engaged in putting their policy claims at national and EU level. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Pesic, for <clears throat> uh, a lot of food for thought. And now we have uh, a distinguished panel of uh, five discussants um, that I will not introduce in detail because I think you've all received their biographies. I will just briefly say um, where they work now and uh, a few more maybe important details. So we will start with um, Robert Kozma, who is member of the Executive Council of uh, Let's Not Drown Belgrade movement, uh, and he's also a green left political uh, movement from, from Serbia, and <clears throat> he's also member of the parliament and also member of uh, the Serbian Parliamentary Committee on European Integration. Uh, after uh, Mr. Kozma, we will um, have uh, the, 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 the honor to listen to Dr. Serjan Tvić, who is currently the president of the International Advisory uh, board of the Belgrade Center for Security Policy think tank uh, from, from Belgrade. Um, and before joining BCSP, um, Srdjan worked in many different capacities, but most recently he was a senior policy officer at the Europe and Eurasia program of the Open Society uh, Foundation, and he's also a member of uh, the BIAPAG policy group. Um, after Dr. Cvić, um, next speaker will be uh, Dr. Vedran Džihić, who is a senior, um, senior researcher at the Austrian Institute for International Affairs and also senior lecturer at uh, the University of Vienna. He's also co-director of the Institute for Advanced Studies in, in Rijeka. Uh, and then after uh, Dr. Džihić, um, we will um, listen to Mr. Tobias uh, Flesenkamper, who is currently the head of office of European uh, Council of Europe in, 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 in Belgrade. But previously, he worked in various uh, diplomatic capacities, uh, including the European External Action Service in Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, and the Council of the European Union in Brussels, uh, and the OSCE. And last but not the least, we also have one uh, discussant who is uh, present um, via via Zoom link, I suppose. His name is Mr. Andrea Cascone. He's um, currently posted as the director for the Adriatic and Western Balkans Department at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and he has a, also a rich diplomatic career, which started in 1987, and he served in various um, various capacities at the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So with that, I will pass the floor to Mr. Kozma, and I will ask each uh, discussant to maybe, you know, use five minutes uh, for, for their initial kind of comments, and then I will um, maybe ask questions and, and uh, also open it up for, for the audience, either in the room or via Zoom and um, via Facebook, because we have, I think, around five um, uh, people listening to us via Facebook and around 20 on, on, on Zoom. So please, Robert, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Eidos. Um, okay, I will 
um, firstly, at the, at the beginning, uh, shortly present the political movement uh, Nedaimo Beograd. I will not go through the whole history of the of, of the movement. I I would like to say that yes, we are the new green left uh, political actor, hopefully uh, a rising one as well. Uh, um, I mean, since the last uh, elections, we are the biggest oppositional grouping in town assembly. Uh, we have succeeded in uh, receiving support of 100,000 citizens in Belgrade. On a national level, we uh, succeeded in uh, getting the support of 180,000 citizens uh, in Serbia, uh, which allowed us to have our parliamentary group in a national parliament called uh, Green Left Club uh, Nedaimo Beograd. Uh, our uh, current political agenda revolves around uh, three main uh, pillars of, of our political program. Uh, it's actually uh, fighting for the protection of uh, the environment, uh, on which one of the main focuses we put on the, uh, on the fight for the clean air, especially because Unfortunately, air is uh, polluted uh, across towns uh, in Serbia. Also fighting uh, for a solidar and just uh, uh, society, uh, which means that we are fighting against uh, uh, an enormous social and economic inequalities in Serbia. Unfortunately, Serbia is uh, on the top uh, of the European countries when it comes to the huge social uh, inequalities. And the third pillar of our program is actually fighting for the democratization and uh, decentralization. Uh, I would just like to stress that uh, we started like eight years ago uh, and started as a, as, as a small initiative, informal initiative group of citizens that were actually interested uh, in, uh, you know, urban development and actually citizens' participation in urban development for citizens to be asked of what they would like their city to look like and how uh, public uh, resources should be managed uh, in accordance with the citizens' needs. And uh, of course, one of our approach is that urban development also means to have sustainable development, to have the protection uh, of the environment. And uh, because of, I mean, and from the beginning, environmental issues were part uh, of our political uh, program. I will here uh, try, try to raise two, uh, uh, two topics, uh, is that uh, for, for us, when we started the fight uh, a couple of years ago for the clean air, I mean, it was something that we were advised uh, by the, a couple of pollsters like, uh, to not do that. For somebody who were already a political actor you know, a couple of years ago, or we thought that we are a political actor, we want to become the proper one. So we started from initiative, but then learned that we need to establish a political movement to embrace the membership, to have the proper structure, uh, bodies, etc. And for us, it was important. We saw that the Belgrade was often, not only Belgrade, but uh, other cities in Serbia, uh, often had uh, so strongly polluted air. And first, uh, uh, advice that we get from the, for instance, pollsters was, it's not a political issue. Don't do that. If you want to attract uh, and get the citizens' support, you need to have more mainstream political issues. And we had, of course, also other mainstream political issues, but for us, it was like, come on, it's a, it's a, it's a topic that concerns all the citizens in, in Belgrade, all the citizens in Serbia. Polluted air is also a health issue. We need to deal with that. So basically, once we started to fight for the clean air, it was like deliberate decision. Maybe this is not uh, politically uh, uh, a good thing to do, but I think that like, it's an honest thing to do. It's an honest thing to start activities to raise the awareness about the polluted air and to propose measures to tackle uh, the, the polluted air in that way. Uh, so why we started that? Because we believed it in, in it and we thought that citizens will uh, uh, notice the importance of such issue. Uh, that when, for instance, pollsters or other people are asking citizens, what is for you the main uh, uh, political uh, issue, they start speaking, you know, in the same phrases they are used to, but when you, you know, ask them, but what is important for you? And then you 
uh, you uh, get to the point where for the citizens it is important to solve all you know uh, 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 all daily questions that they have around their life how they will get to the work which public transportation they will use i mean whether their children are gonna you when they go out here where to play where they're gonna uh, you know uh, breed uh, clean or polluted air so because of that we started you know uh, uh, that as our part of our political agenda and the second uh, 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 thing is that Fighting for uh, for the protection of the environment, it was always interconnected struggle, and it was always regional struggle in that way. It was always interconnected between various citizens' initiatives, you know, then initiatives uh, uh, such as grassroots, but also civil society organizations, but also uh, the persons from academia, because in this, you know, triangle, you get the knowledge that you need in order to raise awareness and to propose the concrete measures. So it was always interconnected and it was always in a way regional. And to use the example, when we started four years ago, I mean, we started with the initiative for the clean air. It was loose initiative among, among different actors, a political actor, uh, informal initiatives, grassroots initiatives in towns across, in 20, towns, uh, 20 uh, cities across uh, uh, Serbia. And we, I mean, we started with a simple uh, idea. We need to have the proper measurement of, uh, of, of the state of the, the, the air in the cities. If it is polluted, we, know, we need to know how much it is polluted in order to have the proper response. So basically at the beginning, it was interconnected among various actors from civil society, from uh, academia, from professionals, from also then political actors that little by little recognize the, the, the potency of, uh, uh, or, or in a political way of, 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 of this matter. Uh, then, for instance, once we started the petition, you know, uh, uh, to support our uh, measures that we proposed, you know, immediately uh, in, in, in the first month of that petition, 20,000 citizens, you know, signed it and, and stated that it is important for them. And when I say it was always a regional, a regional issue, it means that we learned, you know, in the Western Balkans region in that way from one another, for instance, uh, air, uh, clean air application that we can now use in Serbia, it was actually developed by Macedonian activists that actually, you know, came contact us and said, listen, would you like actually to adapt this application also for Serbia to be used? So basically the, the sharing of knowledge, it was always uh, as well regional and also the sharing of knowledge, it was always uh, 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 a way of European cooperation because different activists from Europe, for instance, were coming and trying to uh, not only support us, but provide us with their experience and knowledge. For instance, when we speak about fighting uh, for the preservation uh, of, of, of the riverbanks, for instance, you know, you had a huge activist movement in Europe as well fighting for the clean air, fighting for the small uh, hydro, uh, against the small hydro plants. I mean, it was always regional approach as well. Maybe it was not through EU structure, but it was uh, uh, in that way, genuine cooperation between uh, EU activists. And also to give another example, a couple of years ago, for instance, uh, European Fund for the Balkan supported one of the first uh, network uh, 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 that was called United Balkan for the Clean Air. It was actually cooperation among organizations and activists from Albania, from Kosovo, from Macedonia, from Montenegro, from Bosnia, and from Serbia. Because in all of these countries, you have polluted air. And to use one example, 16 coal-based power plants in these countries of the Western Balkan region produce more uh, sulfur dioxide than 250 power plants in United uh, in European Union. So basically that was a huge issue, you know, for the activists, but also for the citizens. Maybe citizens were not uh, properly, uh, uh, pro uh, 
or properly informed about the problem, but it was the role of the activist civil society organization, and by my opinion, also the role of the political organizations, you know, uh, uh, to inform citizens what is happening and to direct them in uh, in, in in a proper direction. Uh, and of course, civil society organization will provide their knowledge, but for us, it was to organize together with the citizens in order to send a clear political message. And that was our road. And hopefully now, while we are in institutions, we are trying to bring our struggle also from the streets into the institutions. But as we would, as we like to say, we are uh, with one foot on the streets, one foot in the, into the institutions. So, and we strongly believe that you need to use different tactics and different strategies if you're fighting for something that you believe in. And to conclude here, may I would like just to stress it once again, the struggle was always interconnected and it was always regional uh, when it comes to the fighting for uh, in the environmental issues. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cosmo, for this uh, interesting presentation about uh, the Nedavim Obeograd movement and its tactics and, and evolution. <clears throat> the next up is uh, Dr. Sergeant Tvić, please. Well, Philippe, uh, how much time do I have? <laughs> Five minutes. minutes. Okay, yes, so uh, and will we have another round or yes? We'll, we okay. will have it. Yes. So I'll um, maybe I'll um, start by um, basically confronting um, two different periods when it comes to um, the link between the democratization and European integration, and try to link to these issues. And maybe give a couple of personal examples as well, because I think uh, um, my return to Serbia kind of marked uh, the clear beginning of the second or maybe a, a mature phase of the second period, I would say. So uh, I think from 2000, uh, when we had our democratic revolution in Serbia, um, we had a period where we had this uh, happy marriage between uh, uh, the democratization efforts and the European integration. Uh, uh, reformists, democratic political parties were uh, running their campaigns uh, with the EU at the center, right and left of their slogans. Everything was about that. And that lasted for uh, quite a number of years. Um, uh, and I'm not sure when uh, the divorce actually between the two started. I mean, there were several phases, you know, like in a couple, uh, things start going bad and uh, you don't actually divorce quite uh, immediately. But, uh, 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 right. But, uh, uh, but uh, I would say that uh, one of the first moments uh, was the um, uh, financial crisis and then the, the, the global economic crisis that followed the migration crisis. And there are two factors that contributed mm -hmm. Uh, to to the toxicity of this relationship, to quote you, Robert. Now, uh, uh, one is basically um, uh, this um, Euro, uh, the enlargement fatigue, as we boringly call it, on the side of the EU. And the other one, I would say, is uh, particular for Serbia, but I would say uh, not maybe so much to the rest of the Western Balkans. It started in 2012 when we had the change of government and uh, when a, a constant daily drip of poisonous anti-Western and anti-EU propaganda started on most of the electronic and print media outlets uh, controlled by the regime. And I think these two factors contributed to the divorce. And, um, and now fast forward to uh, 2022, and I really enjoyed reading uh, uh, Yelisa, uh, Yelena Pešić is in Elisaveta Vukilic's uh, paper. And, uh, and I want to talk about the environmental protests in this context, because this was the moment when it was uh, clear, I think, to everyone that there is a huge discrepancy between the two. Uh, 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 basically, uh, uh, maybe just to come back, because I have time, there was another signal 
which was not properly, uh, um, let's say, uh, Serbia's fault or Serbian regime's fault that contributed to this divorce. It was uh, 2019 after the European Parliament elections, when after lengthy negotiations, uh, uh, the European Commission uh, placed uh, a basically uh, uh, Orban's uh, guy at the helm of the enlargement effort, which was probably a signal that uh, <laughs> democratization will not exactly be at the center of the you know, EU's approach to the region. We see uh, um, some of that these days. Uh, but I will not talk so much about that now. Uh, we can talk about the environmental protests. Basically, uh, when they started, um, what the paper uses this term, uh, 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 transnationalization of protests, uh, 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 basically it was clear that uh, this didn't happen. And when we talk about the transnationalization, there are two I think elements to it. I'm not like <laughs> academically uh, interpreted it, is how I understand it. Uh, one is that uh, basically uh, no neighboring country was involved, although it makes you wonder uh, why uh, certain groups in Bosnia weren't uh, concerned, because I think if some of the worst scenarios of uh, this lithium mine take uh, into like happen, then it would definitely affect. Uh, the neighboring parts of Bosnia. And uh, the second thing is, uh, we call it in, in the NGO kind of slash academic, uh, academic jargon, uh, the sandwich between the international community and the local uh, civil society, political groups, movements. Uh, the sandwich where the pressure on the government to do, uh, to let's say, to have more democracy, to speak in this term, uh, let's say not to have the lithium mine, because it seems that the majority of the Serbian population is very much against it, um, didn't work. And uh, you call it a timid support of the EU for the construction of the lithium mine. I'm quoting the paper, but uh, I'm not sure if it's support, but certainly there was lack of support for the environmental protests in that sense. And uh, I think there... The, we have to have a global picture in mind when we talk about this. Lithium is important for um, for the green transition. Uh, uh, you know, uh, the Western actors uh, are lagging behind China in uh, in uh, control of the extraction processing of these uh, uh, of the this critical mineral. But uh, but having said that, there are a few places that the West can secure to extract it for its own benefit. So it's understanding that there is quite a lot of interest uh, to have this happen. But the question is how. And uh, and uh, coming back to the to the and we can talk about that in the Q and A. I don't have time now, but I just wanted to say that uh, for me there are basically. Uh, two results of this divorce between democratization and EU's and Western's clear support for the grassroots uh, movements here in this particular instance, for exa example, of the extraction and environmental protests. One is obviously negative. It will be more difficult for the citizens to fight for what they think is right. The second thing is uh, there can be quite a lot of misuse uh, by third actors of the protests and try to, let's say, um, capitalize on the eventual failure, possible failure of the beginning of this mile. But there is also a positive one. And I think this is where, and I will end uh, this first part with this, the positive effect of this divorce is that democratization becomes more organic. and. There is also another thing, uh, which is uh, the enormous political capital uh, that these environmental protests brought, which is the ability to unite uh, the left and right on one single issue, and uh, and and uh, which is probably a necessary element if Serbia ever hopes to uh, basically end this regime and decapture the state. And, uh, uh, you know, when I say united left and right, certainly it's better 
to run a campaign against, if you somebody called it uh, neo-colonialism earlier, then to run a campaign against uh, uh, based on the nationalistic hatred against the neighbors, for example. So I will end here. Thank you, Sergen, for this uh, really, really inspiring uh, analysis. I really like your metaphor <laughs> of divorce. And uh, I think it, it, it speaks well to this uh, dissociation between European integration uh, process, which technically kind of moves on and like really dire state of Serbian democracy. Actually, Serbia and Montenegro are, I think, the only two countries ever uh, that actually, you know, backslided from the status of democracy to the status of a hybrid regime during the accession uh, process. So now we can really start questioning whether the European integration is uh, still, you know, a democracy promotion project or no. I think Dusan Pavlovich has a very interesting piece which was published a few days ago on exactly that topic. Okay, so uh, the next speaker is Dr. Vedran Džihic. Vedrane, please. Well, Filipe, thanks a lot. Uh... And thanks for inviting me. I mean, first of all, I, I don't think that I can uh, follow up uh, with personal experiences on the metaphor of divorce and uh, marriage, but you, know, you never know, it, it might happen. <laughs> uh, no, but on, on, on serious terms, uh, I mean, I think there, there is a divorce between democracy and, and, and European integration, obviously. Uh, but what I want, want, want to say uh, and start with this kind of a puzzling uh, question at the beginning, I mean, uh, listening to the ambassador and, and to uh, the project manager from the European delegation, uh, you just get the impression easily uh, that all these efforts that we have been in uh, since 2000, <laughs> Uh, we sample a grant the work the client. Uh, yes, no, is this ambassador calling? No, uh, <laughs> no, the uh, uh, just wanted to say that listening to you know EU integration, we need to reinforce, we need to be wise, we need to speed up, uh, uh, tax, so we need to invest civil society, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. It really resembles a kind of a Groundhog Day, that uh, moment that has been ongoing for almost two, two and a half decades. And the puzzling moment is, why for God's sake, uh, and Philip, you just mentioned, why for God's sake, Serbia is in the worst possible shape uh, since, since two, two and a half decades. Uh, uh, I mean, you, you can't imagine a, a situation uh, in terms of, of, of governmentality, of governance, of, of, of toxic public sphere, uh, hatred, uh, et cetera, et cetera, that will be more uh, worse than, than what we have right now uh, in Serbia and parts of the region. And I think this is a big puzzling question. So I now let me just make brief four points. I mean, the first one goes, because this is, uh, Osservatorio was forgotten with the logo, but you know, I have to make reference to Italy. And there is this important piece of work by Donatella de la Porta, uh, where she uh, borrowed uh, uh, terms from the quantum physics in order to describe social movements and the effects of social movements. And she introduced this moment, like three stages that a protest or a social movement needs to go through in order to change the society. And the first one is cracking. Uh, the second one is vibrating. Uh, and the third one is sedimenting. Uh, and what she argues for is that cracking is the production of the sudden rupture. Uh, and we could say Rio Tinto protests were probably on the brink of this sudden rupture. Then the, came, the war in Ukraine came. Uh, and I mean, it's, it's not difficult to judge from, from this point of view, but I think that was a kind of a possible uh, moment of, of this production of sudden rupture. Then she says, vibrating is a form of contingently reproducing those ruptures. So then, I mean, you get a stone in the sea and then it starts vibrating and the third stage is sedimenting. Uh, and sedimenting is stabilization of the legacy of the rupture. Uh, now the, the question is, and it's quite obvious that in, in the Western Balkans, besides, let's say the example of North Macedonia or back Phyron, uh, who managed to to crack and vibrate and then to a certain extent sediment, but then the EU came in and is now trying to 
to to to go it's from sedimenting back to back to to vibrating and cracking destroying the process uh, to a certain extent but that's another issue uh but besides the example of north macedonia uh unfortunately we haven't seen uh uh, this process of vibrating and sedimenting in substantial manners when it comes to, to civil society moments. Uh, uh, the question is now, is it because the civil society, the protest movements, etc., etc., are not good enough, uh, not able to produce this momentum of vibrating, or is it because the regimes uh, and the structures are strong? Uh, uh, and I would argue it's obviously, like, usually in life, it's, it's the mixture of, 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 of both. But uh, I think we need to underline how strong this behemoth uh, of authoritarian governmentality uh, is. Uh, it has this tendency of self-producing itself, like Vucic's regime has. Uh, it works with all possible tools and tactics of, of soft repression, of, of, of using legal tools, of... Uh, slap campaigns, blaming, shaming, uh, it's self-interested, self-obsessed, uh, it's adjustable, it adjusts this to different situations and circumstances quite fast, and it's difficult to crack. And now comes the question, I mean, what are the usual ways how to, how to do it? And I think there are like three uh, possible approaches to this one. The first one is within and through institutions. This is what Nedarimo Beogel uh, is trying right now. I mean, just Robert, you said one foot in, and one foot out, but with this one foot in, I don't know if this is the left or the right, I would say left, uh, but you have two left feet probably. Uh, <clears throat> then, then the question is, I mean, this is the puzzle. Are you going to accept the rules of the game uh, that is played now in the city assembly? And I mean, you know the problems, we know the problems that you are facing or in the parliament, which has become a Monty Python bed uh, kind of a show. Uh, or do you and how you manage basically to change the institutions from within? I mean, this is an internal human dilemma, like back to 68, or I mean, wherever you take, it's always the same dilemma. That's, that's tough. And I think your job is a tough one, uh, but a brave one because you decided uh, to take it up. Uh, the second one is resistance outside. Uh, that means staying outside, trying to elect Jens Kasselidanos in Belgrade recently, uh, saying no, taking it to the streets, trying to produce uh, uh, new moments uh, of, of, of solidarity, of commonality, and try to address the, the, the regime. Uh, uh, but I mean, this is what regime so far, like in Serbia, has been dealing with easily. Sideline, sit, watch, observe, put some legal pressure, uh, put them into the media, blame them, shame them, uh, and, and that's done. And the third one is refusal. Uh, I mean, it's like institutions, resistance, and refusal. And refusal would be, I mean, a kind of a saying no uh, to all the rules of the game, uh, let's say con concretely in Serbia. I mean, what the Iranian women uh, did with taking off the scarves. It's this absolute kind of a, of, of a refusal. And I, th I think we haven't seen so much of the refusal uh, in the Western Balkans, uh, but I think we need probably in order to topple the regime, if you wish to speak so, because the way towards democracy is now just blocked uh, uh, in many parts of the Western Balkans. We will need a combination of the of the three. So probably we will need three. Uh, I mean, not only left and right or left and left foot, but an additional one uh, uh, able to to help us. And now comes the question: Is the EU or can the EU potentially be the third one? The third feed that we that that we need, and unfortunately, uh, it hasn't been so far. Unfortunately, uh, and uh, and and uh, it has even contributed to this. I mean, what you just described, Surgeon, and you, Philip, to this unbelievable contra contradiction, basically, uh, of of having front runners like Montenegro and Serbia uh, uh, with the biggest gradual autocratization during the process of can candidacy or being or negotiating with the EU. I mean, that's that's horrible, uh, that's horrific, and that needs to be told and repeated again and again. Uh, and I just wanted to, to conclude uh, uh, and to spare another point for, for the next round, but when it comes to the EU, and there, there was one significant moment for me where recently where I recognized basically that that something is utterly wrong and we need to work on this one. Uh, with the European Fund from the Balkans, we have uh, 
two or three years ago started a process called Engaged Democracy Initiative, where we work with activists, grassroots movements, embrace this regional dimension, Robert, as you underlined, uh, I try to bring them together, uh, in, invent tools, share practices, and we organized uh, in 2021, in September, we organized a con the Convention of Democratic Engagement uh, in Belgrade. 120 activists, two days, Robert was here and many of you. Uh, and the word, I mean, the EU was not mentioned a single time. Not a single time that someone stood up and said the EU, EU, this, nothing, no EU whatsoever. I mean, now we are going to have a next convention in Pristina. Uh, Katarina Tadic from the EFB is here uh, uh, in May, and now we can do the experiment and check whether in, in Kosovo uh, the EU is mentioned at least uh, uh, from time to time. But the problem is that we lack this kind of, uh, uh, I mean, someone spoke here about the the, the, the vision, the horizon uh, that is that is needing in terms of inspiration, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We need this one, and uh, otherwise, all these processes are not going, not going uh, to deliver. Uh, and and then the final question is basically, uh, I mean, and this refers to this transnational moment, uh, moment of transnationalism. Uh, is this that we need a big moment of cracking, of a new cracking within the EU? Uh, within the EU as a constituency following the war in Ukraine that could only lead to some kind of a vibrating uh, and, and, and sedimenting of, of European values that are enshrined in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the European treaties and that could renew this kind of a very much needed democratic momentum in the semi-periphery semi of the European Union, which is the Western Balkans. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Dr. Dikic. Um, since the time is running out quickly, I will uh, immediately move on to uh, Mr. Tobias Flesenkamper. And yes, please take the floor. Do you have the, can, can you please uh, pass the mic? Mm -hmm. Or this one, this one here, yeah. This, yes, I don't know. Can you get the slide, please? Right. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. Just go on the next one. Thanks. Okay. Good morning. Um, it's good to be back here. And thank you very much to the organizers. Thank you very much to the Osservatorio and the partners um, for inviting me to this panel. And thank you very much for the paper that Yelena presented. And I concentrate myself on, on two or three points, um, rather three. Um, number one, I'm here for the, for the Council of Europe, so I'm not here for the European Union, I'm here for an organization that is bigger. I put you a little bit of a view of what we're looking at. Um, it's not the whole Council of Europe world, but it's very centrally Southeastern Europe in there. And um, the Council of Europe, of course, um, is a bit older, it's 75 years old, Serbia is a member, and this is, of course, very much uh, linked to the ideas of human rights, democracy and the rule of law. Um, and it also has, of course, someone, some countries who are no longer a member, like Russia, but has others who are a member and founders, like the UK, uh, which are not in the European Union. And, of course, um, Kosovo made an application to join the organization last year. So that's what I am and um, what I'm representing here. And um, that's what basically Europe is. And when we talk about Europe, we talk about, of course, Various issues which have meant, been mentioned here. One of the issues, of course, is the equality of men and women. And if you are here in this wonderful rectorate room, and I count exactly two women on these paintings of rectors of the University of Belgrade in the last 200 years, it shows us either how far we have come or how far we have to still go. And if I also look at Rektor Popovic over there, um, for those of you who have been in Belgrade, know that she is certainly an inspiration for many when it comes to contestation. Um, and also for defending academic liberty and integrity. The last time I was in this room um, was actually just before the, I mean, no, I was in the room afterwards, but the last time I was in the room sitting here in an academic conference like this one um, was just before the pandemic. And um, this was on the 1st of uh, December, uh, 2019. And um, basically this was 40 years, uh, no, 50, 40, I don't know, 40 years, 40 years um, after the famous Congress uh, of The Hague um, when the relaunch of uh, the European project was done in 1969. 
And at that time, someone who's probably a bit uh, associated with the idea of contemptation and civil society and, and, and building Europe um, was um, the Chancellor of the Federal Republic, Willy Brandt. And he said um, at the opening of the conference in The Hague on the 1st of December, 69, when it was about relaunching Europe, something we heard today, he said, if you were all well with Europe, we would not be meeting today. If the community were able to speak with one voice, our main topic here would be foreign policy, the question of the peaceful organization of Europe, negotiation with the countries of Eastern Europe, and our interests with regard to the conflict in the Middle East. Now, this is a couple of years ago. It hasn't changed so much. Um, but also when we talk about Europe and the Europe you see here, um, and I really congratulate the organizers for slipping in the Europe from below. Of course, we come into the pre-divorce time and someone who was a president of the European Commission, Romano Prodi, he held a very important speech back on the 6th of April in 2002. This is pre-divorce, Sarjan, um, which was entitled Europe Beyond the Borders, Europe from Below. And that was at the time the president of the European Commission. So this is certainly pre-divorce. And um, so if you, if you look at this kind of Europe I'm, I'm just putting up here, um, you see um, that we are actually indeed under the same horizon. And that's why I took a little bit of this spheric view, which of course is very much connected to our view of the world as being one and as, as the world exactly of the year 1969, when when we had the first pictures emerging like this, and we had people in space for the first time just a couple of weeks before the Congress in The Hague, and they looked at the NDRS and it said it's one. And then I, go, get, I bore you with the last quote, and when we talk about horizons, it always comes up, is uh, the Chancellor Adenauer once said, Chancellor of the Federal Republic, other one, <laughs> uh, said, we're all living under the same sky, but we don't share the same horizon. Um, and that's clearly now the case when we talk about the topic of today. So looking at environment, contestation, civil society, democracy, and I will go to the second slide, please. Um, can I have the second slide, Diane? Yes. All right. Okay. All right, sorry. Um, so second point, uh, democracy, development, et cetera. Now, the one thing that we talk about democracy is a predecessor of some colleague of mine in the organization back in the 50s, 60s, when basically Yugoslavia made you know, shy approaches to the Council of Europe in Strasbourg, couldn't we join the Council of Europe? And that colleague who was a deputy secretary general said, yes, well, you're not a democracy. So what is a democracy for us? Um, well, the colleague once said, it's very simple. Democracy is where you can advocate and work for replacing the government of the day without being put in prison and without fearing um, to be removed from your job, without fearing even worse um, um, repercussions. Now, and if you look at the issue of environmental protest and contestation, of course, we, we see exactly some of those problems and they're not actually the privilege of the environment movement only. It's the issues related to the freedom of assembly which is, of course, always an indicator of democracy. I remember, for instance, we had the Pride Parade um, and the issue of freedom of assembly last year. We had the freedom of assembly with rela relation to environmental protests. We have uh, administrative harassment. I remember that money laundering lists were circulated about NGOs saying these people were actually more associated to crime than to advocating for the environment. We have slaps, I think it was mentioned here. I mean, the use of legal means to silence dissent or um, silence uh, you know, business undertakings or critiquing of business undertaking. So you have a bit of a, of a full package here of, of things, but it's also very much related, of course, to a certain model of development, which I think this bridge here, which many of you know, is very much an example of the problems of the level and that model of development that also is being used still here. So it's a model of development of the 20th century. It's a model of development of mass projects or huge infrastructure projects, which somehow seem to be building bridges, but actually are not building bridges, they're actually separating countries. Um, they're used with huge amounts of money. Um, and built often by slave labor and um, 
here in this case, even with European loans and implemented through Chinese companies. So I think in that perspective, we can we have need to discuss what we're discussing here, that there is a critique of a model of development, which obviously is uh, maybe no longer functioning, but still runs its course through the Balkans. Because capital is available and you can run it out and you can roll it out. And um, it's actually maybe we're talking about the wrong things because we're not talking about the extractive um, practices, which was the mining example, which is obviously and blatant. But wh why are we not talking about other things which are also part of the problem of that development? Traffic, cars, mass car ownership, and all these kinds of things. Why are we not really talking so much about waste? Uh, the waste treatment, the production of waste, and the whole kind of livelihoods that are related to waste and the certain lifestyles. And also why we're we not talking enough um, about climate uh, change and conversion in these kind of things, but we rather have, as yesterday or the day before yesterday, people sitting on non-high-speed trains in massive investments of connectivity, but at the expense of local connectivity, of the expense of getting in a healthy way from the Faculty of Political Science to the Rectorate in this town, you cannot go on a bike. There's zero investment on this. It's not even a tram line. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry, I can do it. <laughs> oh, well, oops, you see, if I do it. But there's also, of course, something which is working, if you will. And um, I think I'm very grateful for Yelena mentioning, of course, the hydro plants and this whole idea of... Um, resistance is possible, um, etc. I think one of the big examples is this beautiful river Viosa and or uh, Eos um, in Greek, um, which has been saved. But now, of course, that comes with a certain narrative about untouched nature, remoteness, a little bit of orientalizing, a little bit of the last, you know, resources in the European continent, the Balkans, etc. So it comes actually at also the level of a discourse of, you know, you don't do this development, but you, you need to do this development of not being developed, of maybe staying behind. And, and it doesn't come yet together in a discussion of resourcefulness. And that's why I think we need to talk more about people. And it's also interesting about what kind of people we are not talking so much. You're not talking about, for instance, those who are suffering most of environmental racism, like the Roma community, also in this country. You're not talking about national minorities. We're not talking so much about marginalized areas and peripheral areas within the periphery. Um, uh, so I, I think here's something, and here's also something the Council of Europe has to offer, because we also have to talk about landscapes and culture and how they're formative and how actually the previous level and the model of development, which has been contestated, is actually not about landscapes and cultures, but is actually basically about the, the use and the consumption of landscapes and cultures, and also um, not linking us maybe closer to uh, more sustainable ways of, of building Europe and, and also you know, biodiversity, soil erosion, and all of these things. But here, I think it's really about also listening to the people who live on the territory. And that I would also say from my experience here is sometimes which we miss in the discussion. Uh, we actually be moving into discourses and astroturfs, um, if it were, but also very abstract models where we actually discuss the models of development, which have been the ones which have been leading us maybe very much closer to the abyss, uh, rather than actually building some sort of contestation on a much more fundamental level, which also puts human life in the center. And when you do then something which I really like to do, it's, um, and I'm very grateful to Bill Gates, um, it's the function control F. And control F, as you know, helps you to find keywords. And then you go through the text which you're given for conferences and you go through it and see like, well, in the text that was given here, there was not even the mentioning of the word human rights. Now, for us, this is, of course, the key point now in the Council of Europe to connect human rights to a right to a healthy environment and a right of life. And that's why I wish that also the next papers could maybe discuss this a bit more prominently. Thanks. Thank you, Tobias, for this uh, perspective from the Council of Europe. Uh, we will get back to or your, your private perspective, but still as someone inspired. that has inspired by Council of Europe. Uh, so the next speaker is going to join us, I assume, via Zoom. Maybe I can 
uh, ask Dan to maybe help us out. Uh, the next speaker is Mr. Andrea Cascone from the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Andrea, can you hear us? Yes, I hope you can hear me. We can't hear you, that's the thing. I see that Andrea. Hello? Hello, yes, now we yes. can hear you. Okay. Please, the floor uh, is yours. Thank you so much. Um, I think now you should be able also to see me. Uh, well, thank you so much for inviting me. It's a pleasure, although I'm not uh, uh, there in uh, Belgrade, which is a pity, but I'm uh, very happy to share just a few thoughts about this uh, interesting uh, uh, topic. Uh, the, uh, the title of the panel actually uh, identifies a key issue uh, for, for, for the future of Europe. And that is how to uh, re-energize the European project from below, or if you wish, how to rethink EU policies with a bottom-up approach, which has been really the uh, driving to uh, topic for the conference on the future of Europe, this uh, uh, quite extensive exercise that was carried out last year. Uh, and uh, if you uh, follow that discussion, uh, you have noticed that climate and environmental issues were really at the front uh, uh, run of the discussions. Um, the, uh, I will not go through the main results of that conference. And I'm, I believe these are uh, quite an extensive uh, uh, report that where you can find the, uh, uh, the recommendations that were put into this conference. Very interesting from many angles, but the main uh, uh, issued how to put the citizens, civil society at the center of the project uh, to make sure that our policy are in line with the expectation of the European citizens continues to be, I believe, the and will continue to be the main uh, driving um, issue in the European debate. Uh, this is an issue that is not just important for those who are already member states of the European Union, but also for those who aspire to join the European Union like Serbia and all Western Balkan countries. And Italy is uh, very much convinced that uh, the future of Europe depends on Western Balkans as well and their integration in the European project. That is why in November, 2021, we decided to organize and host in Rome a forum uh, between youth from the European Union and Western Balkans. And it was a unique experience to see 75 students from uh, um, 33 countries to sit together for four days and discuss uh, some of the issues, including, of course, environment and climate issues. Um, and uh, they all produced, I mean, this, they were divided in working groups. They all produced recommendations that at the end we took as Italy on board and uh, we presented to the conference on the future of Europe. Now, um, the interesting thing is that the working group on environment uh, came out with some recommendation that goes very much in the same uh, line, the same direction of the policy paper that you just presented. For example, the need to implement independent monitoring mechanism and organizations, legislation, transparency, monitoring, monitoring pollution levels and deadlines for transition implementation, or uh, encouraging uh, capacity building of civil society organizations, improving and expanding grassroots projects, by connecting regional projects and good practices. I think this is a, a clear indication that the policy paper uh, that was presented identifies some very uh, common features and really reflects what is the mainstream uh, feeling and uh, a demand from uh, the uh, from the base on how to uh, reshape, rethink uh, in European policies and the methodology in which we work. Uh, now, this allows me to focus a little bit on the recommendation that were presented in the paper. Um, in particular, uh, I wanted to focus on two. Uh, the first one is, I think it was presented under letter E, uh, as further encourage cross-border cooperation uh, uh, between environmental organizations in Serbian and neighboring countries. Uh, this is, in my opinion, quite uh, uh, a key challenge, and it is um, important not just for environmental issue, uh, but also another strategic area for in European integration process of Serbia and on all Western Balkans, 
for example, a rule of law or fundamental, right, uh, fundamental rights. Uh, my experience, I mean, uh, is that there is still a lot of work to be done in this respect. It was very interesting to hear the experience uh, highlighted by Mr. Cos um, Cosma because that gives me the hope that uh, something is moving at least on cross-border environmental cooperation. But when I look at my our experience as a, a country that is trying to do something to increase uh, uh, the capacity of countries in the region to work together on these issues, I must say that there is a, still a lot of uh, work to be done. Um, we still receive very few projects, for example, that have a regional, a cross-border approach on these issues. There is a, still this need to overcome what I def, uh, describe as a working methodology that reflects a cultural mindset, mindset that is based on the national interest on the national territory. Now, in order to overcome uh, uh, this, uh, um, this methodology, Italy is uh, promoting since 2021 grants for small projects, including the one that has been uh, awarded for uh, this project. And uh, we would really very much welcome any new initiative uh, with a regional approach followed on the discussion uh, that you're, we are having uh, here today. Um, the other uh, recommendation I wanted to uh, focus a uh, briefly on is actually um, a set of uh, uh, recommendation which are under uh, letter G, H, I. So where you uh, highlight the need for uh, promoting transparency, accountability, um, building citizen trust, um, continue to work on promotion of participatory governance. If you read it together, I mean, to me, this gives the clear uh, indication that there is a problem of trust, a problem of trust towards uh, not just the uh, local government, but also towards the EU. And that makes me really think whether this is also unfortunately reflecting the broader issue of the perception of the in Serbia of the European perspective. Um, and on this, I uh, just wanted to um, make a few comments on what was very interesting described by a uh, surgeon as the divorce between democratization and the EU integration. Um, well, first, uh, I think the experience shows that democratiz uh, democratization is not a linear process. And if you uh, look at what is the debate in some of the EU member states uh, on the rule of law, you know, you have a clear example of what I mean, uh, but not being linear process. On the EU uh, integration process, uh, you see the problem for me is that the, um, it's not that there is a divorce. I mean, the problem is that the EU integration is not advancing. And that's the uh, main challenge we have to uh, uh, address today. And Montenegro is a, a, you know, a case in point. Problem and in terms of uh, uh, um, and challenges to uh, the democratization of Montenegro really started to appear when the integration process um, unfortunately uh, suffered a halt. And the, and the problem there is, uh, in my opinion, is that the European integration today is a uh, hostage of a mentality that prevents integration to uh, advance. And that mentality is that based on a very simple notion, which says that if you want to advance, you must reform your system, you, you, uh, you must reform uh, your, uh, your laws and, and so on, which is fair enough. But the problem is that we are asking to reform most of the time to those who would actually um, most likely lose the most by reforming. So it's without putting any incentives at all. And this is what we are missing today in the integration process, especially uh, in the Western Balkans, is the capacity by the EU to incentivize the process, to uh, push the process of changing or transforming the system by creating the, uh, the um, space for, uh, for moving ahead. So um, on this, I think the, uh, it is important that uh, to look at what is today the debate which is taking place in, in Europe, in the EU, and it is to look at the concrete measures on how we can start integrating 
through uh, the countries the, um, like Serbia, even before the process is uh, concluded. What we have uh, been discussing on the so-called accelerated integration measures, this is really something to look at very um, uh, with, with great interest because there is a potential there to create a new dynamic in the enlargement process, to create a new dynamic also in the integration process. The experience done with the first enlargement process in 2004, 2007 shows very clear that even when you arrive at the end of the negotiating process, it's not say that you are a full-fledged uh, democracy, that you are a full-fledged member state that is able to cooperate and work within the European Union uh, um, as, uh, as the others. So that is why it is so important to start the integration in advance so that you prepare, you train these countries uh, and you create the right incentives to move forward on a very challenging um, path as the one for reforms. I have, um, uh, I will stop here and better be happy to uh, follow up with the, any questions you have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cascona. Now, initially I thought that we will have five minutes each for the second round, but since we are behind the schedule, I will have to shorten it to three minutes. Um, I know it's going to be a challenge. I will ask each and every one of you one question based on, you know, your speech or or my thoughts about your your interventions, and then we will open it up for questions and answers from the audience, either in the room or via Zoom and Facebook. So let's start with. Uh, Yelena, um, your, I really enjoyed your paper. We don't have the time to kind of uh, now uh, discuss many points that I wanted to, to raise, but I wanted to use this opportunity to raise one particular point that you make in your paper. Namely, you criticize a political cooptation of um, environmental grassroots struggles. Now I see where you're getting from and this political cooptation can be um, quite problematic, but uh, it seems to me that uh, it's not necessarily always negative. I mean, I wanted you to, to reflect upon this uh, because through the political cooptation, we also get these environmental issues onto the agendas of political parties. And also this political cooptation has shown to be a very powerful mobilization tool for the various opposition parties, which cannot agree about anything, but the environment seems to be like this uh, symbol of resistance uh, against the government. So if you can briefly uh, reflect upon this, this uh, problem, thank you. Okay, thank you, Philip. I'm, I'm not criticizing, I'm just pointing out that it is something that it happened. Uh, uh, what we have done in our second study, and that is something that I didn't put an emphasis in this policy paper, is that uh, we have seen, we have seen, especially when it comes to Rio Tinto protests, that there is a kind of um, ideological blending or maybe a, a, a falling of the ideological borders between left and wings, uh, left and right wing appropriation of these environmental struggles. So, as I mentioned, we have this kind of discursive framing in terms of anti-colonialist, anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist, and so on. But also we have a lot, we have seen a lot of this um, uh, discursive framing in terms of exclusionist um, um, narratives about connecting the negative role of EU with the Kosovo issue or with the Russia support. So we have this kind of right-wing appropriations which could, you know, uh, and that is something that, okay, we are we, we want massive support, but do we want this kind of support? That's, that's, that's my, my argument. Thank you so much. Um, now I have a question for um, Robert. Um, I mean, I, I did some research on the early days of uh, Let's uh, Not Drown Belgrade, in, in which I published together with Professor Fagan in Environmental Politics Journal. And uh, one of our insights was that at the very beginning of your movement, the movement was not really focused on uh, environmental issues. It was more about uh, who destroyed property in Savamala, justice, rule of law, so on and so forth. But at some point, um, the, the, the initiative really uh, went green, so to speak. So my question is for you, uh, why and when and how this change happened? Briefly, sorry, it's, it's a big question, but uh, you have three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Eidos. Uh, I will try, I mean, 
to respond it uh, really briefly. Uh, the same is whether you go and ask uh, the question of per a person living in Loznica and he lives in rural area and area and uh, he's into agriculture, whether he consider himself to be environmentalist or he's fighting for his livelihood. He will tell you, I'm fighting for my livelihood. The same here, when we were started organizing ourselves, we were speaking about how Belgrade is developed. It was basically to speak about our livelihood, you know, about our cities. I mean, for whom you develop the city. That was our main, let's say, issue that we, you know, uh, that we were uh, uh, organizing around. I mean, we used one example of the, the by our opinion, uh, a still very criminal project of Belgrade Waterfront you know, which you approach it through, through different ways, you know. My way of approaching is that, you know, you are using the whole public resources from Subotica to Buenovac to pour it into something that is called, you know, private uh, project. I mean, it's not private, it's publicly funded. By my opinion, you cannot use the public money, you know, without asking the citizens, and especially you cannot use it uh, I mean, to put it in a private project, luxur luxurious private project, while you, you know, stop in in investing, for instance, into the healthcare system. But the main question here is, was we have some resources in our city, you know, and consider these resources, you know, as financial, et cetera, you know, like and special resources as well. How we will use them, you know, for the benefit of the all citizens, or minority of the citizens. So that was, you know, the, 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 the issue. And then when, I mean, the whole, when we started, you know, when you speak about the urban development, you also speak about sustainable urban development. And here you come to the, you know, uh, issues of environment. And one of the main problems in Belgrade and still is, still uh, is, is polluted air. And of course, once you start, you know, speaking about this, then you attract also activists from that field who, you know, for instance, I brought the book uh, Air as a Common Good of uh, Predrag Momčilovic. He, 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 you know, he was an uh, uh, activist mainly interested in, in you know, in environmental issues. At the beginning of our fight, he was not with us. But once we, you know, started speaking about the sustainable development of Belgrade and, you know, fighting against the polluted air in Belgrade, we attracted a new kind of activists that at one point felt uh, as they're at home. And then, then they started considering our political organization as their home. And then they contributed, you know, uh, also with their knowledge. So, you know, little by little, you know, left and green agenda, you know, started working together. And then we realized, okay, we are now becoming the proper green left political movement. And of course, I mean, through the, our personal communications with the European Greens, once that type of the connection was initiated and, and installed, I mean, the, then you, uh, in that way, you know, created the, the new political actor also that have more, uh, uh, you know, proper communication about uh, its political agenda. But I mean, that's the, you know, history of development and how you recognize some issues, you know, and how, how you call them, you know, at the end. So basically, uh, the, the, the every, you know, history of development of each organization, you know, represents the development of the, you know, uh, the phrases, the words that you use to put the quote around those, uh, you know, issues. I, I hope that I responded no, no, totally, to your question. Totally. I think it, it was a totally natural evolution and uh, and a good one in my in my view. Um, so, Sergen, uh, how to make European Union integration great again for democracy? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I think um, actually. It's actually easier than it seems, and uh, uh, and uh, Andrea Cascone rightly uh, uh, said that uh, the EU integration is not advancing, and that that has an impact on the democratic development. That that's definitely the case, 
and the way to solve it is uh, basically, you know, you can talk about different models. Somebody mentioned staged accession. There are people advocating adherence to the single market and so on. But I think simply we have a methodology of um, EU, negoti EU negotiating framework now and the voting system sucks, basically. The voting system is such that a single member state can block the advancement of another candidate country or, you know, potential candidate country for that matter, for reasons that have nothing to do with the EU accession criteria. You know, we have it, uh, we are living it uh, very vividly in the in the case of North Macedonia. You know, so until we uh, basically reform the voting mechanism and we introduce qualified majority voting, we can propose whichever system we would like, uh, but it would be a mere, uh, you know, bisturi in Italian, a facelift uh, uh, in, uh, in, 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 in when it comes to, you know, the accession uh, negotiations. Now, I mean, there's many things I want to say, and uh, there were interesting things mentioned when it comes to uh, how can actually professional uh, uh, civil society organization, organizations cooperate with the grassroots uh, uh, organizations. There are good recommendations in the paper. I can tell what my organization is doing in that field. Uh, I don't think I have time now. So if somebody is interesting during the Q&A, I can talk about that because we left a bit that uh, part of the paper um, untouched. But I just want to say, I think we, we discussed it like this. Uh, everything in Serbia these days is about the um, Serbia Kosovo deal and uh, and uh, uh, you know uh, I'm repeating this but there is a sense in which this issue is the biggest smoke screen of them all um, and until it's resolved we will not be able to focus on other important issues that somebody mentions are unifying for the opposition for example environment rule of law we're all about Kosovo, and this afternoon at three o'clock, uh, people will be going to protest uh, for the illegal sacking of two uh, pro brave prosecutors who stood up, uh, you know, who did their jobs and were removed from office. Our Laura Kovecis, you know, how we call them. So I invite you all to go there. And I think that would be an interesting contribution from this panel at three o'clock. Yeah, it will be interesting uh, <laughs> yeah. to see whether whether anti-deal uh, symbolism will appropriate the, the, the demonstration. <laughs> Anyways, uh, thank you very much, Sergeant. Um, now I have a short question to Dr. Dihic Vedrenem. <clears throat> You studied really, um, you know, closely this authoritarian governmentality, and then you discuss how we can bring, how the, the regime can be changed. But I wonder to what extent, uh, I mean, do we have guarantees that even if this regime is changed, this authoritarian governmentality will not survive? Because it's the practices, it's discourses, it's the ways of doing things. And... Um, you know, who guarantees that even if the regime is changed, that these illiberal practices and rationalities of government, authoritarian rule will not survive and will not, like, infect, uh, um, you know, whatever government comes after? I think it's, it's like, usually in life, there are no guarantees. <laughs> uh, but I think what, what we could say when we look in, into the Western Balkans closely uh, in a kind of a longer historical perspective, uh, we could argue that the moments in the islands uh, in, in time where we had <clears throat> proper procedures, institutions, uh, a sense of, of, of the changes possible like Jinjic brought it in initially. Uh, uh, but this is basically, that was just glimpses in time. Uh, I mean, we, we can't just go and and and, and don't don't see basically the fact that particularly the 20th century in it, on the territory of former Yugoslavia has created a very deeply entrenched uh, uh, 
authoritarian governmentality, if you wish, but you could also say practices of, of informality. You could also say practices of, of, of gender relations, which are based on patriarchy. You could say practices of, of clientelism uh, uh, and, and, and corruption. You could easily also say uh, uh, the, the, the tendency to have this strong man uh, able to poison uh, and to control the whole environment. I mean, uh, in a long-term uh, perspective, I think uh, this is unfortunately, but but the semi semi periphery of, of of this part of Europe uh, has been uh, uh, reproducing for for decades and for almost centuries. Uh, now comes basically the question. I mean. Is this the moment of desperation? So if we say, okay, look, this is a whole legacy and these are practices, they, like, they are capillary, I mean, have penetrated uh, all of us, basically, in the way how we operate. I mean, if I want to uh, get an appointment or have a, have a conversation with you on, on, on any issue, I'd, I'd probably just grab a phone and, and, and call and try to get it and not go through some regular, regular procedures. But now no, the, the, the point is, basically, I think... Uh, the, the desperation uh, and depression that we see so much in Serbia nowadays, uh, also among activists and, and civil society activists, uh, is obviously not the way uh, to go. Uh, and then the, the crucial and fundamental question is how basically to, to organize and mobilize resources around certain basic pillars of what constitutes, let's say, livable life, uh, to borrow the expression of Judith Butler, or what constitutes the human dignity this notion of human dignity uh and and i think there are certain questions and, and tobias alluded to first of all to this major concept of human rights uh i think we need to recenter it recenter basically our approaches to, to this human rights approach and that includes and i think that will be a, a major shift not only for the region but also for europe to think or rethink europe from the margins uh not bottom up that means uh Think it from 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 the Roma population. Said down. Think it from from the from from women that uh, are victims of, of femicides in in Turkey or in, in Serbia. Think it from uh, from slaves basically working in factories in in, in Serbia or in Bosnia, uh, producing goods for the for the European market, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And and this is a kind of a broader notion that I mean we could describe it as real utopian horizon, but if we don't have a horizon, if a society don't have a vision, then you give up on it. And then you just open the space for the this authoritarian government to, to spread endlessly. I think uh, uh, that, that that that's the momentum. And this is, I mean, I think this is where Nedarmo Belgrad, Ženska Solidarność, these efforts like Jean Monnet networks, what you do, uh, environmentalism, this is where it fits in, in a way, but it needs to be uh, more coordinated, more, it needs to, to vibrate, vibrate a bit bit more intensively than it has been so far. Yeah. Excellent, thank you. Um, Mr. Lesenkamper, um, can you please give an advice to grassroots organizations and ENGOs on how they can use um, Council of Europe better in their struggles? <laughs> well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, you can all use all, any organization for any kind of struggle. Um, you need to populate it. Um, I, I think it's the Council of Europe has one body which is called the Parliamentary Assembly. Mm -hmm. uh, so get elected, like our colleague, try to be in the Parliamentary Assembly, uh, engage with the Parliamentary Assembly. Um, at the end of the day, this is where, where things are put on paper and what is put on paper is good. Um, because we believe in this. The other thing is, of course, uh, we have one thing that is going on now very practically. There is a, uh, the Reykjavik Summit in mid-May of the Council of Europe. And there's even a website where you can put your submissions and your ideas for European unity and um, what the Council of Europe should be doing. This is open to everyone. Um, and it's interesting how, how few people then are actually writing down things. Um, and because I checked with my colleagues how many submissions we got. They go straight to Reykjavik, to the foreign ministry there. Um, so I, I think there are various ways to engage. But um, maybe if, I, if, I, if you allow me, Philip, it's, it's just the centrality of the human rights and the environment 
I mean, it's nothing new, as we all know, since 72 at the latest. This was clearly on the agenda. It was on the agenda of the Council of Europe, and it was also on the agenda of uh, the, the predecessor state of, of the country we're in here. Um, because in 72 following, we looked at exactly the impact of the environmental degradation um, on human life, uh, the perspectives of human life and also on democracy, because the moment you have scarce resources and scarce access, it will hierarchize, uh, make a hierarchy of access, and the hierarchy of access will determine life chances and by this actually limit everyone's ability to realize their fundamental rights and freedoms, including their right to life. If you look here in Serbia, the life expectancy of marginalized populations like Roma, environmental racism study comes in mind, is much lower than of the people who are sitting in this room. Many of you would almost be at the end of your life now. Um, and that's a real effect of denying human rights on an environmental basis um, by distributing life chances in an unequal manner. And that has to do with very fundamental access like uh, access to drinking water um, and, and of course clean air and all of these kinds of things. And But here we need to of course think about two things. One is of course, how do you want to organize your development? I, that's an open discussion, but we clearly know that uh, you know uh, using uh, fossil fuels is not the way to maintain uh, a path of development which wouldn't end, mean the end of the species. Um, we are not there yet, but I mean what we see here, and I think this is something that the European Union needs to reflect about. Their plans for development are still very much fossil fuel centered for the region. Um, it's not exclusively fossil fuel, and Andrea is absolutely right, but there's a lot of fossil fuel th still in this, uh, and that's obviously not good. The other thing is the problem of what kind of technologies are being rolled out and what kind of factories are being put in place. I mean, for instance, Serbia is the biggest producer of tires uh, in Europe, and there's exactly the reasons that Jelena's papers point out. Um, there is, there's a reason why a tire factory moves from, I don't know, from uh, Panura Padana, to, to Serbia, or why the tire factory went from Flanders to Serbia. So I think that's something the European Union has leverage. Um, there's legal leverage for this. Um, and then the last bit is maybe really on, on how do we build European unity. And actually European unity is also built around the issue of creating a livelihood inside Europe that is sustainable. Um, and then we need to look at what can strengthen, and here I come back, how you engage with us. What strengthens European unity and uh, what strengthens European unity is, of course, uh, moving uh, towards the standards and working together. That's why the transnational element is so important. And clearly, the environment is the transnational agenda per se. Um, I mean, the European uh, unity was actually pushed forward into many cycles, circles throughout the last decades by putting environmental issues on the agenda. Take a simple thing like drinking water directive 1980-81. Um, and the second thing is what, what actually then creates European unity. And there, of course, law is creating European unity. I'm a firm believer in law. I'm a firm believer in cooperation and things written down and adhering to this. And what we see sometimes with this geopolitical bend, I, I'm, I'm afraid that that may be a very useful approach to things. But it, somehow we should make sure that we don't forget what we are really good at. Um, and here, I think we, we, we feel that sometimes we could look a bit sharper on how law is being implemented. Um, and how law is being created as well, because nothing prevents states, also Serbia and others, to create new mechanisms and hold themselves accountable. And if it's not possible within the small limitations of the nation states that have been created here in the last years, then of course we may need to think to strengthen the European intervention in this. At what level and with what kind of mechanism, I don't know, but I I think there are instruments like, you know, European public prosecutor when it comes to the supervision of this funding then that comes from European taxpayer and is invested in projects here. Why not having some mechanism of linking already the European public prosecutor's office? Why not looking at environmental supervision agency? I'm not saying replacing the laboratories in Serbia or in Bosnia and Herzegovina, but maybe giving them a second instance where people can actually go a little bit like to the Strasbourg court and say, look, I got these numbers. I'm not really sure if they're okay. Can I actually ask you to test them for me? So basically just some checks and balances, which is sort of a European intervention because there's also a European interest, you can argue this. Because if you look, for instance, at the pollution of the Danube River Basin, 
um, the Danube. We have invested a lot in the European taxpayer has invested a lot to make the Danube blue coming into Serbia. Unfortunately, it's not leaving blue from Serbia, but which actually wipes out all the investment in water management in, in Romania, which have been made. Because once the Danube leaves Serbia in a non-blue state, you cannot make it blue anymore in Romania, although they have invested a lot in their purity of water. And then, of course, the non-blue Danube goes into the Black Sea, and then we're looking into the livelihoods and the fish reserves and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the delta and everything that is related to it, which will be very important for uh, feeding also the world. So that would be one thing. And the third element um, uh, on this as well, I think we really need to, to look, and this is much more market-oriented, but this is very good because the European Union is a market, and that's also a good thing as such, is that we need to have a better overview over procurement and um, public and private procurement and make it much more competitive and controlled so that these kind of mega projects cannot go ahead without proper tendering and, and control mechanisms. And I'm afraid that also here um, it would be nice to earlier on have a European dimension on procurement control. Thank you, Tobias. Um, I want to be fair to all the participants, so I will ask uh, Mr. Cascone um, briefly just to take your crystal ball out and tell us what do you see? Is this uh, deal in Brussels, if we can call it a deal, this proposal, is it going to unlock the European integration process and maybe move things, you know, in, in a good direction or you're rather pessimistic as to how things stands when it comes to the future of EU enlargement in the Balkans? Well, <clears throat> um, honestly, um, I don't think we have uh, the privilege of uh, uh, being too optimistic, but also too uh, pessimistic. I think we have to be realistic. And the reality is that uh, at this speed, uh, we are going to have more problems on the enlargement uh, process. Uh, there is a clear understanding, at least from some member states like Italy, that we need a change. And this change has to come immediately because we are losing the region. We're losing not just the uh, governments, which are usually the immediate counterparts in the enlargement process, but more importantly, we are losing the civil societies in the region. They are more and more uh, skeptical. Um, what we need is uh, some serious discussion on the uh, decision mechanism. I couldn't agree more with what Sergeant was saying, uh, it, there is a clear issue of how we adopt decisions about the logic. And what we witnessed in the uh, past two years, but we can rewind it also for the last two decades, uh, was a clear uh, proof that uh, uh, the um, unanimity is now uh, just uh, uh, fire backing on the, on the process. Um, at the same time, we need to, uh, as I say, to be realistic and to look at what we can concretely achieve uh, in, the, uh, in the short term. What we need is uh, something immediate. 2022, honestly, was a very positive year. We, uh, despite all uh, we had to go through, we uh, uh, did unlock the negotiations with the Albanian uh, and uh, North Macedonia, we granted the candidate status to Bosnia and Herzegovina. We managed to move ahead with visa liberalization with Kosovo. Um, the, the, the issue now is that the, we will be facing increasing pressure for a Ukraine-Moldova integration process, and we cannot, we cannot afford Western Balkans to uh, uh, lag behind in this integration process. No one benefits from this situation. That's the main point we have to keep in mind. Not the Balkans, not the European Union. So there is a need to clarify what we really want in terms of uh, uh, sustainable advancement. I would really stress this notion of sustainability of the enlargement process. There is an issue, of course, of the absor absorption capacity by the EU. Uh, but that goes beyond, I mean, the uh, enlargement process. I mean, the, uh, it's an issue of uh, uh, functioning that is already there. It, it's, it's not that because we uh, 
project the, to pass from 27 to 33 that we will have a problem inside the European Union, now we function, now we deliver, adopt decisions, that, that problem is already there, already now at 27. At the same, at the same time, uh, we need absolutely um, to, uh, to create some new dynamism, to keep the momentum and to make sure in this historic moment that we don't lose the Balkans, because uh, that is a crucial uh, area for the security of Europe. But also, I, let me stress in terms of what is Europe about? What is really this project? And this project will never be finished without Western Balkans. I hope I answered your question. Yes, thank you. Thank you for your honesty. Um, now we shall open it up for the questions from, from Zoom, Facebook, and the audience. We have uh, one lady in the fourth row. If you can please introduce yourself and uh, uh, and yes, microphone. And I will also invite uh, Dr. Buzogani to also uh, maybe wrap up if you have any any comments uh, after the entire session to to kind of to reflect upon. Hello. It works. <laughs> um, hello. Thank you very much to the organizers and uh, to the speakers. Um, and thank you, uh, thank you, Dr. Pesic, for that uh, very stimulating policy paper. That was very interesting. Uh, my name is Nina Djukanovic. I'm a PhD student at the University of Oxford, and the focus of my research um, is the resistance to lithium mining in Serbia. And um, the feeling that I can't quite shake off is that perhaps all of us in this room are a bit guilty of uh, downplaying or perhaps underestimating the importance and also the success of the anti-lithium protest that, we, that we've seen in this country. Um, Dr. Pesic, you made the comparison with the small hydropower plants protests, um, which you consider to be more successful in uh, implementing institutional changes and also creating transnational networks. Um, but perhaps we could disagree with that because after all, isn't not the cancellation of the entire project or you know, the changes of things like a spatial plan, um, a really institutional, um, let's say, uh, change. And I would say that the blockades that we saw, which happened also with solidarity protests across European cities and across the entire world, were also international and transnational in their very nature. Um, Dr. Cvijic, you also mentioned that Bosnia was not very involved um, in the entire situation, but in fact, um, as I heard from some of the local NGOs uh, in the Loznica region, uh, one of the first cooperations was with their Bosnian counterparts, and they also heard from their Bosnian colleagues about uh, the plans for lithium mining. And with uh, regards to other neighbors, Romania was a very important actor because activists from Rosha Montagna in Romania who were fighting against a gold mine for more than 10 years, uh, even came to Serbia to share their experience with uh, anti-extractivist efforts. Um, and finally, Dr. Jihic, you said that uh, there was very little cracking and uh, no refusal as such. I thought that was very interesting, the quantum physics metaphors that you used. Um, but I think uh, maybe the issue that sometimes we have in this country is that our memory really is very short uh, because the protests happened just over a bit over a year ago, you know, and what we call 2021 environmental protests, I think should really be called anti-lithium protests. And maybe Mr. Cosma would also argue because a lot of people were saying that actually things like air pollution, which directly affects way more people, were completely forgotten by this uh, massive mobilization of the people. Um, on 4th of December, which was the biggest blockade that took place, uh, approximately 100,000 people went to the streets. It was across more than 50 locations in Serbia. And that is not counting the international cities, as I mentioned, uh, Prague, Paris, London, uh, New York, Washington, just to mention a few. Um, so, you know, I would, I would politely disagree and argue that this was a really massive mobilization and a huge effort of the people um, to, to change things. 
Um, so my question, albeit a bit provocative, but asked in a in good faith, is whether perhaps you would say that we ourselves are victim of cynicism or some sort of desperation, as you, uh, Dr. Jihich mentioned. Um, because maybe it's the academic circles that after all are more cynical than the protester themselves because it seems that we are forgetting um, how successful they were and maybe on one hand it's the cynicism on the other hand it's maybe also the authoritarian governmentality indeed or the regime that in the last year or so also tried very hard to you know, present the protests as not as big or not as successful, both as we saw during the blockades when the numbers were significantly downplayed by the regime media, but also afterwards when after the project was cancelled, um, it was stated that, uh, you know, it was just a few fanatics or lunatics that disagreed with the implementation. So um, that is my question. Thank you very much again for, for the stimulating conversation. Thank you. Let's uh, take one more. Professor Tokarevich raised his hand. Thank you. Uh, my question actually follows this excellent, in how to say, not a question, but a comment that, that we have just heard. So it is uh, how to expect success of civil society organizations, anything, EU integration or environmentalism. Uh, when actually there is a, using the, the, the uh, words from the debate, when there is a divorce between the society and the civil society organizations, or rather maybe there was never a marriage uh, between the two. The problem is actually that civil society organizations are not an esteemed part of society. They're actually quite hated. Uh, the image of, of theirs is, is extremely poor in Serbia and, and beyond. That's not something that characteristic only, only for Serbia. Um, common people, the society doesn't believe actually uh, activists or, or civil society uh, organizations. They are seen as a privileged group of people. Uh, they uh, get more money than they deserve if they deserve anything. Um, and actually the par paradigmatic case, this is where I, I actually uh, follow from, from the previous comment. The paradigmatic case was actually uh, this Rio Tinto, anti-Rio Tinto demonstrations, and then the victory of Vucic's party in the region that we used to fight for uh, on these demonstrations. Uh, that was for me actually the last coffin in uh, <laughs> in my body or the body of this of this nation, after which I'm not going to participate in any demonstration in this country anymore. Okay, I'm, I'll be, I'm 65, I, some, somebody else should do it. Uh, but, uh, you know, after this, you know, you can see actually a, a, a big divide uh, uh, between uh, the civil society organizations and the society. And to conclude, uh, following... Uh, uh, Vedran, uh, the problem in this country is not only oh, um, the government, it is the society. Faced, uh, somehow, you know, uh, modeled uh, by, the, by the government, etc., etc., but the society is going to be a problem for any kind of change, modernization, Europeanization, etc., for a long time to come. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Tokarevich. Since we don't have any other uh, questions and we don't have the time because uh, we are already in the coffee break, I will ask each and every participant who wants to respond or who was asked directly a question to uh, like really in one minute respond uh, to, to the, the issues raised. And uh, let's start with Okay. from this side this time around i didn't have a question but very quickly i think and there is an important point on this whole discussion of what is civil society particularly in countries like here um let, let's also not forget i mean we are not in in, in an abstract situation there's been a concerted campaign against civic organization over the last 10 15 years um, the first law on foreign agents law in Russia was coming up to the book in 2010-ish. 
Um, there have been a tradition of vilifying, for instance, transnational uh, mobilization in some countries, etc. So it's not that the civil society movement is completely isolated from such global trends of campaigning against this. Second thing, there has been a consolidated campaign, and it's well proven by the fossil fuel industry and also the mining industry and others against civic engagement. I mean, I'm coming from a region in the western part of Germany, uh, you know, where you have the open uh, lignite mining. Uh, this has been a fierce campaign against any kind of environmental mobilization, including calling names uh, to the activists who were trying to keep uh, exactly open mining similar to the lithium, which would have even much more dramatic uh, consequences. So I think we are in, in, in an environment that is, is, is not easy for civic participation in these issues. And we are in an environment where we need to also take this into account. And our Secretary General, now I'm saying it, it's what they call backsliding on democratic values and shrinking space for non-governmental organizations and civil society, including the media, by the way. Um, and maybe last very quick point, because it was mentioned by our colleague from the European Union delegation, I'm not entirely sure that the idea of setting up civil society councils is really the right way to go. Um, I, I think one of the things of associative life and civil society is exactly the pluralism and the non-umbrella, uh, right? I mean, the non, the, the voluntary umbrella organizations, rather than you know putting up structures where people have to associate under umbrella associations, for instance, to access EU funding. There has been a discussion going on like this, which I find not extremely helpful. I'm, I still believe that the best way to support civil society nationally, transnationally by private and public donors is through open competitions and by not forcing movements to adhere to other kind of structures, um, only if they want to do this voluntarily. And there can be also different kind of umbrella organizations, um, as they like. So I think there has to be also a less, uh, much less uh, technical and uh, operational approach by the EU. I mean that, that's an excellent question that you that you posed. And just just a quick reference. I mean, uh, I I don't think that we can underestimate the the the, the efforts made by the citizens by protesting against Rio Tinto, uh, and and no one is doing it. Uh, and it was a mass mobilization. It was a huge issue, uh, and we still need. I mean, this is still an ongoing fight. Uh, as we speak these days and these weeks, we do see probably something new on the horizon, a new attempt of the government to to push it through, basically. Uh, and then that will be the, the the question where we can we can judge upon that one. But my, my point is rather, I mean, uh, Rio Tinto is not the first type of, of, of massive mobilization in the region, on the regional level. I mean, I think about my home country, Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, and the Bosnian Spring, so-called Bosnian Spring, uh, that turned out to be... Uh, uh, later on a frozen spring in a way uh, contrary to the climate change uh, pattern uh, then you could also ask i mean was that in vain uh, did we lose time uh, in 2014 organizing people's assemblies trying democratic innovation etc cetera, etc cetera. and the ultimate answer is no actually no uh, i mean all these efforts like 2014 uh, uh, Call for revolution in Macedonia contributed to a change, uh, but I mean we have to see it in a kind of a, a, a metaphor of stepping blocks uh, uh, that are needed in order to try uh, to challenge this governmentality that uh, and with all its tools and, and techniques. And I think Rio Tinto uh, has left roots. The protests have left route. I mean, Nedan Mubarak and your movement and some other parties and civil society organizations are profiting from knowledge that was created, from techniques of, of mobilization that were used, of from frames uh, uh, that were applied, et cetera, et cetera. And I think we have to think it in that particular way, even though looking back to 2014 Bosnian Spring and comparing the political situation in 2023 in Bosnia, which is desperate, one one could just argue, okay, let's commit suicide, a collective suicide, be before being cynical. Uh, then, uh, it's 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 really a tough one, but I really do believe in these stepping blocks, in creating knowledge, in creating roots, uh, uh, in, in in vibrating, not always in this kind of a visible. Uh, the, doesn't always lead to the visible change, but I think that's the, the way to go.
Thank you. Uh, now I will ask Sergeant, then Robert, then Yelena, Andrea, and uh, Aaron. I know we are already in the coffee break, but you don't need to. I mean, it's. Uh, if I just want to give yeah. you the right to, and please uh, keep uh, the time. One. Yeah, yeah, I will. I will. I, I was actually even kind of asked the question, so uh, this is why uh, I I appreciated uh, your contribution, uh, uh, Ms. Dukanovic. Uh, I share your enthusiasm, uh, uh, but uh, and uh, you know, like the, the 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 how this regime reacted to the protest was very telling of the effectiveness of the mobilization because the president saw um, the results of the research uh, opinion polls done at that point, and I think he was petrified, and then he was saved by the bell. I mean, it's awful to use this met this example, but by the uh, beginning of the Russian aggression in Ukraine, so he could uh, drive the campaign in a completely different direction. Had we not had uh, this awful war, I think the results of the elections would be very different, and Robert would have probably around 10, 15 colleagues more in the parliament. Um, uh, to reply uh, to to your uh, uh, remarks, Professor Teokarovic, I wouldn't be so uh, pessimistic. CSOs are no longer hated so much uh, by uh, the citizens. I would uh, invite you to check the latest uh, research that Sratada did and polling. It shows very uh, positive trends, and I think they were... Uh, results of this mobilization and you know something about the CSOs and uh, I, I really I, I really think your recommendation where you invited in the paper the EU to allocate funds for cooperation between professional NGOs and grassroots organizations is very important although we well we would obviously use them but we don't need them we think uh, that it's the responsibility of professional uh, NGOs to cooperate uh, uh, we, with the grassroots organizations. In my organization, the Belgrade Center for Security Policy, we saw a vacuum, really, in the support of grassroots um, organizations that fight for the public interest. And we decided uh, to do this. We think it's our responsibility. We formed a civic committee for the protection of human rights defenders and whistleblowers several years ago with little to no support from the donors, really. We didn't do it because of the money. We did it just because we thought this is important. This is the direction to go. We have um, four outstanding people uh, standing in that committee and helping on a daily basis pro bono, uh, the grassroots organizations in advice and all sorts of, uh, you know, support. Katrina Golubovic, Rodolyub Shabit, Sofia Mandic are there and uh, Vuk Cvijic. So, yes, I mean, uh, there are positive examples. Crta is doing it too, UCOM, civic initiatives and so on. Uh, the next one is uh, Robert, please. Thank you, Mr. But please, one minute. We are already. I'm going to be very. I'm going to be time. very quick. I just would like to respond to the Ms. Jukanovic uh, comment and, and a question. I really think that we don't disagree about anything. I mean, I'm not downplaying any environmental protest. You know, especially not. I'm not downplaying the protest against the lithium mining. We were part of it, and we were part of each of the environmental uh, protests, and absolutely support it. Uh, and we support every type of protest because we know how difficult it is to organizing in that way. And especially we experienced the violence the and police brutality during those protests i mean uh, especially our activists uh, that were there on the streets uh, just to use the example of uh, uh, brutality uh, of the criminals against the activists at the bridge in shabbats where, where uh, there was also our activists i mean so that's one thing uh, so uh, i mean not not downplaying it but to be honest i mean uh, idea of uh, Rio Tinto to extract lithium did not stop, and we are continuing continuing fight with them against it. 
also uh, neither idea of uh, mini hydro plants did not stop there. It's still very uh, uh, present uh, in, in Serbia and especially it's gonna be present uh, if any company see that they, they could profit from it, you know, and we need to, you know, continue uh, uh, blocking it and uh, continue fighting against the lithium uh, extracting in, in Serbia. And our parliamentary group, uh, the uh, Green Left Club, Nedaimo Beograd, uh, at the, each session of parliament, we start our talkings, uh, uh, trying to uh, get the opinion of what happened with the uh, people's initiative against lithium mining. 38,000 uh, uh, people signed the, the petition, the, the national initiative. Uh, they gave it to the national parliament, but we MPs from the national parliament never actually you know, were called to see it and it was not put into the procedure. Uh, so basically, uh, or yesterday, our parliamentary group, we initiated commission that uh, should, you know, research uh, uh, commission of parliament that should research what happened. Uh, we, you know, we propose to establish the commission where each parliamentary group would be present, you know, that's one thing. And uh, also, uh, in the couple of days, we are going to uh, initiate criminal charges against the people that are uh, responsible, that were responsible by the uh, uh, you know, roles that they have in a national parliament uh, to do everything in a good manner with that people's initiative and to present it to the MPs. Uh, they didn't do their job. What they did is actually a criminal charge, and we're going to press those criminal charges. Uh, and uh, I would li like to state here publicly that, I mean, we stated that yesterday also in a parliament. So basically, that's what, uh, what we need to do uh, through institutions, because, I mean, we can see that here, even the ruling government is using the national parliament uh, in order to support the lithium mining and to, you know, in a way, downplay the national initiative against the lithium mining. Uh, and we are going to, I mean, be with the citizens and we are fighting for it. Thank you, uh, Mr. Cascone. Some last words? No comment, just a big thank you for having me in this very interesting conversation. Thank you, thank you for your interventions and participation. And now we have the time for Jelena and finally for Dr. Buzogani to who started the, this panel and who, who will have the last word. Thank Helen, you. Please. Thank you, Philip. I would like to thank you all for uh, useful comments and input that you gave. Uh, and um, I, I'm sure that we will uh, implement them in uh, reaching to the final stage of our policy paper. I just want to answer the quickly answer to the question. I'm, I'm not downplaying also the environmental mobilizations, uh, in, uh, grassroots mobilizations. I think that they were actually very important because they um, is, uh, they brought to they brought uh, environmental issues as the central issues in political struggles. So that is something that was not happening before. So now we have this kind of massive mobilization that is able to mobilize people and to use different kind of discontents in order to, uh, as somebody said, uh, uh, push the ideological political boundaries and to massively mobilize citizens. Uh, what I think is also important that uh, uh, in terms of the success of this. It could be, you know, wavering to success of success of, of, of these mobilizations is wavering, but it is a good uh, control mechanisms for uh, for future uh, attempts to build projects which are not which are uh, which could bring to potential hazards. Uh, if you know that you have this kind of uh, potential to massively mobilize people against this issue, then maybe you will consider, uh, you know, uh, uh, whether whether you should do that. And I think it's important what uh, Robert said that it should be supported by institutional struggles, so massive mobilization of grassroots activists, which are capable to mobilize people beyond, you know, this, this kind of agenda because people are actually feeling that they some that they are fighting for something that it is worth fighting. And then it, if it is followed by institutional action, then I think it could be uh, uh, it could bring success. Thank you. And last but not least. Uh, yes, uh, me and the coffee break. So um, very briefly, I mean, how, how, we've had really various uh, various voices and, and also from the from the audience, we had also very 
contradictory, so to say, positions of Tokarevich saying like, no, you shouldn't, like, it, it makes no sense. You're saying it makes absolute sense. And I think this is also one of the tensions, which is which is exactly here in, in, in the room. So does it make to mobilize? Does it make to 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 work through, through, uh, through the institutions, do all those things uh, Robert uh, is doing? And I think we had a lot of good examples how this, this can work. Of course, it's, it's, it's very difficult. But I, I want to draft to, to make one point, which is basically puts it a bit into a different perspective. And it's also maybe end on a, uh, on a somehow uh, optimistic um, um, uh, tone is that um, basically what we have here is it's not only this democratization, which is, uh, as we heard, maybe divorced from the EU, it's not, not only one transition, but we have something which is, which is coming across the, the road is a is the sustainability transition. So in a sense, in, in, Serbia has, has this, this very specific situation where these, these two transitions are now overlapping. And that, that's, of course, a problematic issue. They, I mean, countries in Western Europe, they, have, they are already very, uh, <laughs> have a lot of problems with, with, with dealing with one of those transitions, the sustainability one. Think of particularly now after the war. And, and I think this, these tensions, uh, are there, and of course, being at the, at the semi-periphery semi of Europe, uh, we had these this examples with the lithium uh, mining and the, the, its relationship to the Green Deal um, shows us that, yes, we, we need to think if, if in, in, in somehow in a, in a larger uh, perspective, see that part of the uh, equation um, happening as well. And, and, and I would go uh, to close with that, um, with, with, um, with, 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 with the, argument also made by Vedran, like, yes, I mean, it, it, it needs to, societal change is a, is a strong, is, is, a, is difficult. Uh, it, it, it's, it's not, it, it needs avant-garde. It, 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 it might end up with a, with a society which is not really taken, uh, taken with, but nevertheless, this is the way what, we, what we've seen in many societies, also beyond the Western Balkans, how social, social societal change is, is happening. It takes, very long time. So let's have coffee. <laughs>
Okay. Welcome everybody again um, for the courageous patients to attend the second panel too. Um, we have uh, in fine, um, we devote our second panel to a regional outlook, and um, in particular, we want to focus on initiatives uh, uh, that were. Um, taking place in this region uh, around air pollution issues. And um, we want to give the floor in particular to those actors uh, that led important initiatives uh, to whom we're very uh, thankful um, and uh, whose voices we listen to for small research that was financed by the Italian Ministry on Foreign Affairs which I thank for, for the support. So this panel in a way is a combination between the two um, section because it has a strong transnational dimension, having uh, actors from the region working in similar fields that um, will then work to um, share their experiences. I, I just want to say a couple of things because we are already lagging, uh, we are late in our schedule, so I don't want to take time. But um, the important thing why an Italian organization is engaged in, in uh, studying and focusing on what uh, NGOs in the region are doing um, has to do with our attention and our interest and passion towards building Europe, Europe from below. Our, interest in having um, a joint initiative uh, at transnational level that includes us. And the reason why um, I think it's also relevant is that uh, uh, despite all the contexts are extremely similar, um, many of the aspects and many of the experiences that emerge from the research from your own um, uh, interviews are the same uh, as Italian NGOs are living and going through. Uh, there are much less and less differences in the context. Um, it's starting from the disparaging narratives of political elites that then create uh, a negative context for civil society to work, where the recognition of civil society's work is um, lost. Um, it, there is this uh, delegitimation that is at work. And Italian NGOs went through exactly through the same experience. Ex as, as much as um, the economic crisis, um, uh, financial crisis from 2008 hit very strongly um, Italian civil society, and also uh, the, in, the, the activities that used to be very strong at transnational, transborder level with, with the Balkans, because there was a strong, genuine interest on the side of Italian civil society for um, supporting the European integration in, uh, of the region. Um, <clears throat> one important thing, and, and then I'm, I'm almost done um, with my small introduction uh, that I wanted to underline, is that um, uh, for also for C Italian civil society, the EU, the, the, this divorce with the EU is a pro is, is an ongoing process. Um, there is a lot of uh, disenchantment and, and uh, frustration on the side of Italian NGOs towards the European Union. But there is also the awareness that the European Union is many things, and including laws and bylaws that um, that we can use as civil society to advance our causes. Uh, and those laws that were introduced uh, in the um, uh, Italian system as a um, commitment is in, in relation to um, to our common European space is what very often NGOs now use in litigation, uh, which use the European law or the Italian law that uh, um, uh, are conform to, to the European ones um, that are very important in many struggles uh, uh, in the environmental field, but also in anti-discrimination and, and the like. So um, uh, uh, what NGOs are pretty strong at now is using uh, the European legal system uh, um, to enforce uh, um, change rather than just try to consult institutions or uh, make um, political advice. And they see um, this li litigation as a much more influential strategy in order to create real change. But of course, uh, consultation um, uh, uh, or any kind of... Um, um, advocacy is also extremely important, uh, in particular towards the general population. So um, I conclude here, although I would have millions of things to, to say, and uh, I thank you all for having uh, reached us around this table, and I'll be very interested in listening to your speeches. Thank you.
Thank you and good morning everyone. I'm Serena Epis from Osservatorio Balcani Caucaso Trans Europa and today together with my colleagues Francesco Martino and Anna Ferro we will present this research project that we carried out on um, environmental challenges and, um, and social, uh, social mobilization in the Western Balkans and uh, um, which is financed by the Italian Ministry for Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation. So um, our general objectives for this project was to understand and to study social mobilization in the Western Balkans with regards to the environmental topics, so to environmental protection, and also to understand the impact of such mobilization on society in the Western Balkans. As we have discussed this morning during the first panel, the environmental topic is um, a field that is able, that has been able, especially in recent years, to mobilize uh, a broad part of the of the population of the society in the Western Balkans, and there are cases of uh, civic initiatives that have been uh, uh, successful in a way to mobilize and also to influence the political and the public debate um, in uh, in the society of the Western Balkans, and also to uh, somehow make uh, uh, their voices heard in the public debate and also in the political um, in the political debate. Um, so, um, in the project, our specific uh, objective was uh, to focus on a subsector of the environmental protection, which is air pollution, to identify and uh, indicate some civic initiatives that have mobilized within this subsector and understand what they did, what their kind of activity, what kind of activities they promote, and also our objective was to bring together this initiative in order to support the exchange of experiences and also of good practices. So just to say a few words of uh, um, sorry of the uh, methodology that we followed, we uh, first of all uh, did a context analysis. So we carried out a desk study to understand the general situation of air pollution in the region. And then we carried out a mapping exercise. So we identified the five exemplary cases from three different countries, which are Serbia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, and North Macedonia. We investigated different aspects of their work. So the kind of activities they carried out uh, their strategy concerning communication, concerning fundings, and also their political mobilization. And then the third part of our research was um, dedicated to a so-called capitalization process, which is meant to bring these five cases together and to foster the exchange of their practices, of their uh, experiences and best practices in, indeed. Uh, so uh, just a few words to say why we decided to, uh, fo to, um, to focus on air pollution is that is because this is um, a pro. I'm sorry. <laughs> this is um, a pro a problem that affects the uh, entire region, and uh, it is of course it has of course a huge impact also on the on public health. So uh, and and of course the the effects that derive from air pollution also influence the effect of climate change. So in a way they increase the environmental vulnerability of the region. So this is why we uh, specifically decided to focus on air pollution also because mm -hmm. as probably we all know the region of the Western Balkans and cities from the Western Balkans are among the most polluted city in, uh, cities in Europe. So I will leave the floor to uh, my colleague that we, is going to present uh, some key findings of the, of the research, of the mapping ex exercise in particular. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Zdravo uh, svima. And thank you uh, for being here. Um, I was asked, of course, to cut dramatically uh, my uh, intervention because of time, which is not uh, uh, a big problem. Uh, first, because some of the points that I wanted to to bring to your attention uh, were somehow touched in the previous panel, which is, I think, very good. And also because I want to leave as much time as possible to the people who made this uh, research project uh, um, possible. First of all, the people that are here with me at the table, which I want to thank one, once again for their attention uh, and uh, their, their help. So I would use uh, this opportunity at the little time I have at my disposal to launch somehow the um, the following uh, phase of our uh, of our panel and trying to uh, use also my capacity as a journalist to maybe uh, ask some questions which I find uh, interesting and uh, you know could make our uh, discussion um, uh, also more interesting. Um, 
one of the things we found during uh, our research uh, uh, that was also mentioned uh, by Mr. Cosma was the importance of monitoring when it comes to air pollution. Uh, we found out that uh, the fact that uh, uh, authorities in, the, in these countries uh, are usually in charge of, uh, of the process of collecting data uh, is to some extent problematic. Uh, that data are very often uh, unreliable or at least incomplete, and uh, that uh, uh, organization from civil society uh, proved to be pretty proactive in uh, finding new ways of collecting data, like uh, organizing alternative nets, uh, mixing uh, uh, private means, uh, the power of new technologies like apps. So I would maybe, you know, ask uh, and see what could be the answer. Where are we at the moment? Uh, is uh, now the level of monitoring also by private means or let's say civil society intervention uh, satisfactory? Um, do you see any um, improvement in the way authorities are dealing with monitoring? Because let's remember that having uh, reliable data is the first step in addressing and addressing the problem. So this is the first thing. The second is uh, relationship uh, um, with uh, the media and how to address the public when it comes uh, to problems like air pollution. Uh, we found that a very uh, proactive um, approach also in this time when it comes to, for example, the use of uh, social media, uh, especially because social media proved um, useful uh, as not a, a traditional vertical way to uh, to communicate with, with the society, like up down, but also as uh, uh, horizontal platforms through which uh, engage the, 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 the public uh, when it comes to uh, dealing with uh, problems connected with air pollution. So again, maybe also uh, a question at the end, uh, do you think uh, this is the way to go forward. Uh, relationship with the traditional media still important. To what extent uh, to really engage the population uh, and communicating, uh, uh, you know, the most important things when it comes to to uh, air pollution in the region. The last point, very last point, uh, uh, was about uh, political engagement. That is how to deal with institutions and and uh, the political sphere. Um, we had a very interesting uh, example with Mr. Cosma, but this is true to some extent uh, all over the region. Uh, civil society in different ways engaged with the institutions, sometimes uh, going uh, to litigations uh, with the judiciary, sometimes trying to at least uh, partially transform into uh, political movements or at least um, trying to engage political parties to put... Uh, uh, environmental issues uh, in their list of priorities. So again, maybe a question for you, how do you see uh, the future from this point of view? Is uh, uh, political engagement uh, like a must, uh, a natural development of your um, engagement in trying to deal with the air pollution and environmental problems in the region? Or this is not like uh, that clear maybe there are other ways to engage with the uh, political um, with the political and institutional actors in the region so thank you very much for being here and I would leave uh, happily uh, time and space for uh, discussion with you thank you very much Thank you, Francesco. Hello, everybody. Hello from that side of the room. <laughs> this is Anna Ferro. I work for a think tank based in Italy, CESPI, and I'm going to follow up from my previous uh, uh, colleagues and presentations to uh, introduce uh, this um, round table that is especially dedicated to the protagonism of uh, activists and civic society um, organizations. Uh, introducing this uh, with uh, an exercise that we took as part of our project that responds to one of the main recommendations that you always find in many paper, papers that is uh, uh, capitalize practices and good practices. So in order to um, uh, um, give uh, uh, the opportunities to uh, these uh, uh, four, actually five, because one organization actually is missing, is uh, Pokret 
Rvada, uh, Nicola Kristic, that is <laughs> out of town, so uh, he would have been here with us. Um, we, um, we developed a methodology and uh, based on the concept of good practice, so not all practices are good. So in order to be good, a practice has to be considered good by the target uh, uh, group that is judging it. So if these people here are saying that uh, someone is a good practice or an organization has a good practice, this means that is good for them. That means that it has tangible and visible impacts. It is not too much expensive and it is fair. That doesn't create inequalities. So this uh, methodology works well, especially with the uh, nonprofit organizations that are willing to cooperate uh, for a sort of uh, collaboration and horizontal exchange. Um, okay, then uh, this concept of uh, capitalization uh, means uh, in, in the most easiest way, exchanging uh, practices, exchanging ideas. And in the process and in the methodology that we used, uh, we first collected all their practices and uh, try to identify those that were considered good. So not all their practices were uh, candidated to be a good practice. And then capitalizing a good practice when, when you find it means also explaining to the others and trying to see if the others are interested to copy, copy and paste or replicate it in a different environment, of course. So we developed some tools that we employed actually from remote because we didn't have the chance to do it in person. It would have been nice, nicer, but still we had some results. So um, don't be scared, but this is the outcome of a self evaluation that uh, we uh, each one of the uh, five uh, representatives uh, um, compiled saying, uh, what are you good at? Uh, which results you really achieved with your organizations? And if you see the um, last two bars, let's say uh, the, there the result is very high in terms of monitoring impact, as it was mentioned before, and also citizen awareness. So these organizations are very good in this based on their self-evaluation. Then uh, a little bit before, you see if they were good or not in getting to an impact in the change, a general change in the society, if not in the public policy impact. And based on their self uh, uh, response, they were not really that good in getting to these results. Some of them were good in getting public attention at the international level, but only some people, some organizations, and in media coverage at local and national levels. This means that some organizations can teach to the others how to reach these results, and some others they can learn. The, um, the main uh, failure also for many of them was uh, getting to funding. So they're very good in reaching citizens, but not in getting funds. So this is a main problem, but it's uh, uh, also compensated by the strong commitment of all its members because they are all voluntary organization. And something that also came out as a strong point is that all their mobilization is based on data on air quality. Some of them, they're able to reach, to collect, to analyze data, and this is their core business, let's say. Others are using others' data in order to mobilize the, the citizens or to reach their goals. So data are crucial when you want to mobilize people for um, the uh, argument of uh, uh, air pollution. And here is the result. Uh, these are the four organizations and they, they will introduce themselves. So when asking, uh, are, you, are you interested in the other practices because they were explained what are these practices about? So you can see that there are different arrows that tell that Ecoformo is interested with the O2 Initiativa and et cetera. So there is uh, something going on between the different organizations. Do you want to know more specifically of these organizations? So in this case, we can see that there is also like a mm, mix of uh, interest, but O2 Initiativa and NIA are also collecting more uh, manifestations of interest. 
And then are you interested to replicate uh, the other practices? Not many really express <laughs> their interest uh, or capacity or time effort that they want to make in replicate another practice because it costs time, resources, human resources, uh, financial resources. So uh, this also tells us that they're more interested to create alliances or coalitions in order to give value to the others that are good in talented in something and then make profit of this. And this is like the overlapping. And in the overlapping, we see that O2 Initiativa and NIA are uh, a little bit in the center of this exchange of uh, uh, practices and good practices. So um, in order to give the floor to our guest here, uh, why was it important this uh, exercise? Because um, these organizations have elements of weakness, but also elements of strength. So focusing on the both of them, it would be easier to uh, create the conditions to create networks, uh, reinforce networks, reinforce uh, bilateral or multilateral collaborations. And also based on the things that were said before, uh, work on capacities to be built for each one organizations and also create the conditions to enlarge these uh, exchanges that sometimes are informal, but to make them formal is stronger. So uh, this is uh, to conclude. And uh, I think uh, I won't introduce each one because I know you're going to be better than me. So probably we're going to follow the, um, the table line and they will introduce their good practice. And then we're going to have a second round to comment and also probably comment if you want on something that you heard this morning, if it's really urgent for you to say it. Thanks. OK, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dejan Lekic. I'm uh, going to present uh, a story about National Ecological Association. Uh, we are grassroots professional organization, something completely new. The youngest person engaged in this uh, uh, in this organization is sitting in front of you. So I'm 57. I'm 57, and uh, unfortunately, but fortunately, I was uh, working with the European Environment Agency uh, as a national focal point for 15 years, and now I'm uh, I'm a grassroots uh, NGO. So, uh, which means a lot, I suppose. Uh, we are focusing at all three levels. Uh, uh, of, of activities that were mentioned just before a few minutes. So the, the, the concept of data collection, of course, we at the beginning, uh, two years ago, when we started, uh, we, we, we thought that we are going to focus on all the topics uh, in the field of environmental protection, but then uh, air quality emerged by itself. Uh, we heard a lot of speakers today saying that the air quality problem is one of the main problems in, in, in Serbia and in the region. So we also did the same. And uh, we have developed a platform called XECO Extreme Ecology uh, that is used to develop applications, web applications and mobile phone applications uh, that are actually presenting the data on air quality and different kinds of data to the, to the public. They're very similar to, uh, to what Mr. Cosma uh, uh, said today, but uh, fortunately, uh, our funding was uh, for, for development of these applications was exactly zero. And uh, uh, hopefully, uh, when, you, when you type in Serbian uh, Air Serbia today on Google or, or Bing, our application uh, appears at the first place. Imagine that. So it is just a small success of, of our work. Uh, but then uh, that's, that's about the, the, the data monitoring and collection we have in our system. We have at this moment more than any other application uh, currently available uh, on the internet. We have more than four, 460 stations uh, with the data, of course, not of, all of, of these data are uh, officially approved, meaning that uh, they are not coming from the calibrate, calibrated etc. stations. Uh, only 70 of them exist in Serbia uh, within the state network and the rest is so-called citizen science network. Uh, the second question, communication uh, and um, and uh, the relation to the public. Uh, we have, uh, during these two years, having in mind that uh, members of our scientific committee uh, are uh, more, more or less, all of them are, are uh, either 
current professors at the university or uh, retired professors at the, from the university. Uh, so we have very good communication with the with the media, even the the the, the, the large media, because uh, these people have uh, impressive careers and uh, something that uh, is behind them is um, good enough to to let the people from media ask ask them for the for their opinion on 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 different topics uh, and that is something that we also see as as our success because we have managed uh, to 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 reach almost all the media uh, the t tv tv stations uh, even the radio stations uh, the the the, ma the maximum level was was reached last monday when uh, at the at the same day the the, the data from the platform xeco appeared uh, you will not believe this but appeared to in uh, major daily newspapers uh, state uh, media uh, uh, sputnik and uh, and euronews at the same time uh, meaning that uh, i think that that is the only information uh, available at all the sites of currently divided uh, europe um, at the moment unfortunately uh, that's about the communication and now about the the public uh, relations and and the media and finally i will i will just conclude with the, with the policy impact uh with the one i would say joke uh we, how do you expect that that uh, ngos and cso will have an impact on policy making if european union cannot have it so uh we have the situation where in the accession process for 10 years, we have exactly the same wording of the chapter 27 of uh, Serbian progress report. There is no change. The, 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 the report on, on, on uh, Serbian accession process for 10 years is the same. You have the same words repeated again and again, saying, uh, okay, you have transposed the legislation, but at the level of implementation, more or less, there is, there is nothing. So, uh, if the NGOs are repeating the same thing, they will have the same impact on the on the on the real policy implementation as the European Union, which is good enough. I mean, it cannot you cannot expect that uh, an NGO with very small uh, amount of of money available uh, can have, or even a, a group of NGOs, or even all the NGOs together can, can have more impact on the on the policy making process and policy implementation which is more important than the eu itself and uh, that's that's something that uh, we should uh, we should discuss and uh, we should we should see how how to to solve this this problem because uh, we heard today that uh, uh, and and it was a very uh, interesting discussion just uh, during the session uh, before this one about the the, the real success of the anti lithium uh, protest in serbia uh, imagine we are protesting about something that might happen and uh, during the the last ten years, uh, hopefully, I, I mean, unfortunately, I know that during the last ten years, the, all the uh, uh, state uh, official, non-official reports are saying that the, the the air quality in Serbia is catastrophic, more or less, and nobody's protesting about that. So we are not protesting about something that is happening, that already happened, but we are we are making a huge protest about something that might happen. Of course, I am not. Uh, against any kind of I'm not giving my personal opinion on that I'm just making uh, 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 I'm just uh, saying what is what is going on uh, the same thing imagine that the country in which uh, the two two major cities on the Danube River have uh, uh, water uh, wastewater treatment of zero percent so Belgrade and Novi Sad the two the only two big cities in, on, at the Danube River they have zero percent of wastewater treatment uh, just compare that to Budapest or Bratislava or not to mention Vienna and again we are some, against something that might happen in the future and we are doing nothing about what is already a problem I will not mention cities of Bor or or city of Smederevo uh, Mr Nikola Krstic is absent today he, he could speak about that if he's here so th that's that's really some kind of I will say misunderstanding of the of the situation because people are not reading the reports, people are not not reading already existing analysis. These analyses are showing that we are having a huge problem with some environmental topics. Not all of them, of course. Uh, I'm not saying that the, the everything is a catastrophe. We have to to be more optimistic, but in order to be more optimistic, we have to work more. Uh, we are 
all day long, uh, 20, uh, 24 hours per, per, per day, seven day, days per week, whole year. Uh, we are hearing a lot of uh, people who are having great ideas, uh, but when we come to the level of implementation, uh, usually it disappears. It is the same with uh, with the uh, anti, uh, I mean, environmental protests. We one day we we, we hear big ideas, and then the next day uh, it disappears. And it is the same as the uh, EU EU implementation. Uh, Aki, uh, the, the one day you will you will hear a minister or uh, NGO representative saying, "Ah, we are uh, at the at the path towards European Union." And yesterday I read uh, uh, a tweet from a very high position official, official before. He said that back in 2008, it was estimated that Serbia will join, will be ready to join the European Union in five years. So 2008 in five, that is 2013. Now in 15 years, we are going to be ready to join plus five. So in 20, uh, 20 years. Why? Because we 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 told we spoke we spoke about very very big concepts and very big uh, we said very big words to the public uh, and uh, at, the, at the level of, of working at the level of, of hard work at the level of focusing at, at the level of continuity we did exactly nothing and I can sign at the bottom of this paper thank you very much thank you very much Alexandra Hello everyone, my name is Aleksandra Bulatović and today I will be representing a grassroots initiative uh, from Belgrade, Ecostraža, but I have some other hats as well. Uh, one of those hats is uh, my uh, affiliation to uh, an organization uh, who is defending its territory from lithium mining as well. It's totally on personal basis, but there you go. And uh, also not uh, um, unimportant is um, my uh, professional activities because I'm uh, an academic researcher. My expertise is in soft security threats in human rights and theory of social control. So I was personally included virtually in all activities related to uh, environmental um, communication between organizations, protests, um, documents drafting, etc. So I sort of am insider in that sense. Ecostraža started as an initiative, an informal one, in uh, 2019. And uh, people who gathered over idea uh, of um, doing something about air pollution are not friends and they didn't know each other before. So it was totally spontaneous uh, gathering on the basis of uh, common interests uh, that they shared. And um, only recently, virtually like last month, it finally became a formalized uh, NGO uh, because uh, we got, we finished the procedure of registration because we want to be able to um, work more and to try to, to, to tackle some other issues. And it's virtually impossible if you are not uh, legally recognized as an entity. So that was the only reason. Uh, as far as the funding, um, we never uh, asked for funding before. Um, if we needed some funds, we were sorting that out among <laughs> ourselves. And uh, by now I can claim that we proved to everyone that you can do um, some major things with almost zero funding. Um, by now, we uh, grew to uh, an online community with over um, 100,000 followers, and uh, we are definitely not just uh, the largest environmental movement in Serbia, but also in the region of the Balkans itself.
So um, in our view, environmental activism is about rights. It's an, uh, a righteous activity to be an environmental activist. It is about our right to healthy environment, which is acknowledged also by Serbian constitution, and also our right to have a critical voice, which should uh, include um, evaluation of work of institutions, or actually the institutions should be open to scrutiny of citizens and to uh, be subject of um, evaluation. <clears throat> So why am I mentioning all this, including why I stated here in the presentation, this quoted sentence that no voice uh, must be left unheard because um, since the very beginning of our public presence, uh, we have been um, indirectly accused by various representatives of uh, institutions that uh, it is not our business to get engaged into commenting on whatever institutions are doing about environment. So can you imagine? And an important part for uh, uh, actually justification of speaking publicly is what uh, Dan previously um, um, emphasized, and that is that you really have to have some reliable data uh, before you can you can hope to be able to comment on it and to be able to engage people in it. Because if there are no measurements, then you cannot really have any measures against anything that uh, uh, is perceived uh, as an obstacle by those measurements or measuring. So. Uh, to raise public awareness is obviously the very first step that you have to make in order to engage people. Because if people are not aware that the air is polluted, and if they don't know where to look for the information, they are absolutely ignorant about the situation and it is simply not an issue in the discourse. And um, it was very important uh, that people understood that from the beginning, that some of the formal CSOs like uh, Belgradska, Otvorena Škola, Bosch uh, picked up and supported local uh, civic initiatives, predominantly informal ones, in uh, acquiring and setting up uh, these uh, small cheap devices labeled as citizen sensors and uh, help them um, uh, create this open data network, such as sensor community, and also applications uh, for easy access to, that, to data. Uh, we have air care in Macedonia, and here in Serbia, we have this valuable work done by uh, NEA uh, with creation of their Execo application. And uh, also people are, um, sort of motivated to acquire their own uh, cheap portable measure, measurement devices. So now we have some data and also we managed to spread the word, so to say. And um, with time, uh, the situation was ripe enough that uh, a public event could be organized, call it a protest, call it public gathering, no matter. Eko Straža did uh, in less than two years, six uh, large scale uh, protests that were uh, labeled as protests for uh, harmless air. And uh, those events gathered between um, 3000 and perhaps 20,000 people. It's difficult really to estimate. The most conservative um, estimate says that uh, the largest pro protest that happened in November, 2021 uh, actually gathered at least 15,000 people. And that's really a huge number because um, correct me if you, if you think that I'm making a mistake, but right now, uh, it would be very difficult to gather 
so many people on any idea except perhaps I don't know in case of some major sports success <laughs> as a as a welcoming uh, event for a sportsman or a sportsman women uh, and um, this uh, uh, during these events some slogans were sort of really echoing with uh, the people um, there and also with the media. And you can see uh, some of those slogans. Uh, please um, pay attention to how they are conceived because uh, none of it is uh, by chance because Ecostraja was really focused on somehow mainstreaming constructive and positive approach to what is going on about fighting for uh, a better air because we all have to breathe. So we have for Serbia, like proactive without smog, uh, then breathe carefully, uh, people against uh, poisoners, stop immigration because of pollution. And uh, with this kind of approach, we were actually aiming at creating the, the widest possible platform. We, we were really hoping, and that happened, that uh, our events will be attended by families, you know, that people with children and pets would come. And it was not really about, you know, uh, creating some kind of atmosphere of uprise, but rather uh, uh, exercising political will of the constituency in a way, uh, making uh, uh, um, representatives in institutions uh, be aware of how people feel about policy priorities. And so this is how it looked. Uh, you can see some of the posters that we used, that air is dangerous and stop the ecological immigration breathe carefully you can see that the seasons changed so it happened almost during two years span time and uh, what were the demands of those gatherings or or protests well this is what i uh, pr presented to you is some kind of a summary of those demands because they changed from a protest to protest but overall it is really about these three demands because it's it's what it is basic accurate and complete information on air pollution because we lack information what is intuitively normal so to say in any participative democracy is what lacks here uh in other aspects of uh life of this political community but especially vis-a-vis -vis environment situation we also uh, lacked uh, any uh, uh, proper policy document this void has been very recently uh, fulfilled because um, uh, the government uh, by the end of last year finally adopted a um, um, national uh, program for protection of air by the 2030. And so this is like um, a step in advance. Uh, what uh, is important in relation to this strategic document that basically um, represents basis for uh, developing any kind of uh, local policies and further measures in air protection is uh, uh, funding. And that is something we still didn't see because uh, when the National Assembly was um, adopting the law on uh, the budget for this year, uh, no money was actually put uh, in that law, but since they almost every month uh, vote on uh, rebalance of the budget, we hope that it might change sometime, sometimes during this year. And uh, the third request, uh, which is something we uh, stress constantly, is uh, monitoring policy implementation and uh, results. And again, obviously, uh, providing information uh, publicly 
because that is simply not something that is being done uh, in an automatic way. So what have been what we have been able to uh, achieve so far? We managed to raise awareness of the general population because air pollution didn't exist as a topic like four years ago. Nobody was talking about it. The mainstream uh, traditional media didn't talk about it. And it was not even present in, in chat rooms at all. So now people talk about polluted air. Uh, we also achieved, um, like we managed to achieve a breakthrough with the media because nowadays we um, are occasionally being invited by the media, by the media to comment uh, on uh, certain related issues. And uh, also they follow our activities and they uh, publish um, you know, material that we send them. And uh, perhaps the most important achievement for the overall general public is that nowadays you can actually find data on air pollution uh, uh, being included either constantly on the screen of TV stations or uh, they report about it from time to time um, um, during the news, daily news or, you know, uh, periodically in different shows. Um, I mentioned already this strategic document that uh, was uh, recently adopted. Um, again, why am I stressing this? This document was uh, finished uh, more than a year ago and um, international uh, donor community supported a preparation of this document. Uh, um, a lot of uh, important stakeholders were included in preparation of this document. And then it was just Sorry, my son <laughs> was sitting there, you know, not without anything going on about it. So the protests that we organized this uh, autumn were actually focusing on uh, exercising pressure on the authorities to to finally adopt their own document, the strategic document that is definitely the, the, the first step that has to be made before any other policies could be developed. So pollution will not disappear on its own. And our plans are to raise further um, uh, awareness uh, via research and advocacy. And NEA is our very uh, important and dear collaborator in this. And we are grateful. For, for all of that, uh, for, because they share um, their know-how with us. Uh, then uh, we would uh, uh, like to advance measuring and monitoring by increasing uh, the network of uh, civic sensors, but also uh, by uh, you know, um, exercising pressure on the authorities to increase the official uh, network of uh, these measuring stations that are controlled by the the, the national agency. And uh, obviously, uh, as this document, the strategic document is adopted, we uh, see that our watchdog role must be continued and further enhanced. And uh, in relation to this uh, are also our plan to, plans to advocate for more funds in our environmental protection. Uh, why you see these uh, pictures here? Um, the picture in the middle is actually a logo of uh, our latest project. We are starting uh, a podcast, and this is the logo of this podcast. A few days ago, we started uh, filming uh, first uh, episodes, so this is something uh, fresh, and it will be soon publicly uh, available. Uh, but also we are trying to, to use different types of expertise, including the expertise in creating visual content in order to enhance our, our outreach. And uh, the, pic the picture showing this design with um, obviously lungs affected by the uh, polluted air is um, a designer solution of a very... Um, 
um, distinguished uh, gra local graphic designer. But the one uh, at the bottom is actually our first experience with artificial intelligence. This is how artificial intelligence sees us uh, to start with. So with this, I would like to end my brief presentation of uh, Ecostraja and wh what have we achieved so far. Um, just to stress that uh, because we are now a formal organization, we will have to also uh, do some outreach vis-a-vis uh, -vis funding and our plans in that uh, uh, aspect are that uh, we engage uh, as large as possible uh, number of people with uh, the smallest possible amounts of funds. So we will not be looking uh, towards international donors. This is our firm decision, but we will be looking into our uh, fellow citizens because what we are doing is also something related to creating a new culture, a new political culture, to uh, something related to reminding people of the concept of active citizen uh, and uh, providing them an opportunity to engage uh, as much as they can, you know, in different ways. Thank you. Thank you, Alexandra. Um, we try to keep 10 minutes each. So Samir from Ecoforum, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, can I change these arrows in the research? Because now when I've heard more about the, the activism of my colleagues, I think that I, I think that we will be interested more. I don't have the presentation. I would like to thank the organizers for inviting us and uh, all the participants. I'm sorry that we don't have more people here engaged, but uh, I guess this voice will be heard. Uh, just uh, shortly to present myself, uh, I'm coming from the industrial city of Zenica in the middle of Bosnia-Herzegovina, and we have the problem with uh, steelworks, with industrial air pollution, which started a long time ago. But uh, And we were aware of the problem in the 1950s, 1960s. I think that uh, we were the first city that introduced the environmental tax for the pollution in 1964, 1965. Then the production stopped in the 1990s and after the privatization of the steelworks in 2004, we expected that the new owner, the global steel company, the leader of the, of the steel production will invest more into environmental protection to introduce new technology, but it didn't happen. Then a group of citizens uh, decided to organize to do something and I joined them a year later, and we tried all kinds of activism that exist. Uh, whatever we heard, whatever uh, possibility there was, we used it trying to force the government to force the polluter to cope, uh, to invest more into environmental protection. There are some results. But uh, I, I, will, I just want to share with you the, uh, the ways how we managed to do it. So first, we collected information, which was very hard because it's not easy to get information from the government, which wants to hide the problem, uh, the, pretend that there is no problem and then it'll disappear. So we gather some information. Uh, we use the local media to inform the local citizens of the city. It helped us to organize the protests. So in the beginning, we didn't have any attention from the media more other than local. We didn't have attention from the citizens, from the government, from the polluter. So no one was really caring about the problem. Then we started to do. Uh, local media helped us to gather people to organize the protests. The protests were huge. We managed to gather thousands of people in the streets. And it was the, uh, the first result was that we gathered the attention of international media, which is very important because we are dealing with international polluter, which is very strong. So it's important to get the attention of international media, but the government, they didn't care, the polluter didn't care. Then our next step was to uh, try to use 
legal instruments, such as criminal charges, such as uh, litigation cases. And then the government responded. Then the government said, well, what were we demanding? So now they started to listen. We managed also to change some legislation, change some regulations. So it's a very good achievement. For example, just for example, uh, in our regulations, uh, no foreign laboratory can monitor the emissions from the factory. And we managed, it took us a year, but we managed to change the regulation to ju just to add, if there is no such laboratory locally, then you can also use international. <laughs> Uh, th this was an achievement. So uh, with our legal cases, we managed to attract the attention of the, of the government, but the polluters still, I think. Then the next step was to, because it's, it's uh, logical, the, government, the government's budget, annual budget is 20 times less than the budget of the corporation. So it's, it's the matter of the, of the power. So we tried to find who is more powerful than international corporation is the banks. So now our final attempt, our final way of the, of the, of the activism is to go to the banks because all the banks have their uh, complaint mechanisms uh, because they have environmental policy and we manage to uh, scare away one of the investors few years ago, uh, investment fund from Sweden came. They wanted to invest into the corporation to buy their shares. And then they came. And when we showed the, the amount of the pollution and how, the, how the, the behavior of the company was, they just decided not to invest there. there. And then, and also another thing uh, helped, international media. There, there was uh, uh, some team of journalists from BBC Channel 4. They came to Zenica and they spent a week and they prepared a movie, documentary about air pollution in Zenica and our activism. The next month I had to answer for tens of mails, of Zooms, of Skype calls. They, they, oh, oh, they always asked for more information. And I said, why? Why do you need this information? And they said, uh, here in the studio, we have lawyers. Of, of the corporation, they are waiting for one, one word so they can sue us. And BBC then finally decided not to broadcast the movie. And they gave the story to Guardian, British Guardian, and they published the story. Tomorrow they were sued by the corporation, of course, but it, it was a huge impact. Then we attracted more and more attention. And then with these banks, and with this international media, then we attracted the attention of the corporation, of the company. Then they started to invest into environmental protection. They installed some filters, and now we have some improvement. Uh, just for example, eight years ago, we had 250 days with exceeded uh, concentration of sulfur dioxide in the air. 250 days per year, so almost entire year. Last year, we had 33. So it's six times less. And you can think it's very good, but it's not perfect because the limit, the legal limit is three days. So we still have a lot of things more to do, but uh, we see some results. We are not content, uh, we are not satisfied because, uh, with, the, with the time, with the, how, how fast uh, the, th the things are going, but I have an explanation in Bosnia or in the Balkans, the time goes slower than in the rest of the world. So uh, <laughs> perhaps this is the reason why, why things go slow, but it's very nice that uh, I see that all the organizations have similar problems, similar approaches, and uh, it's very important to network and to exchange these ideas so uh, the results will come for sure. That's enough, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Eli Pesheva. I come from Macedonia, uh, O2 Initiative, Pilio 2 Initiativa. 
regarding the time, um, I'll skip everything that we share, like the battles with institutions and um, and 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 the ideas of um, of uh, getting the 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 organization working. We started. Um, can I? So we, we basically we started in 2016 and um, just like Alexandra said, we didn't even know each other. It was um, one coincidental meeting. Um, it was a lot of people, but uh, during the time we decided that uh, the less people decide on the strategy, it's more efficient than having plenty of people. We, we like to have followers, we like to have help, but less people are better for, um, uh, being more productive, let's say. And um, we started in 2016. We had to be officially registered a um, few years later because otherwise uh, we would not even be invited into the institutions and nobody would share any data with us. Where do I point it so that I can, is it here or here? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, I am, I am just, yeah, yeah. Okay, oh, okay. It's okay. Slow. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's a little bit slower. Okay. Okay, so basically why we started, um, this is Scopia. It's not artificial intelligence. <laughs> it's it, it's a, it's it's a real story. Uh, it was taken by a pilot from Vizer when leaving the city, luckily for him. Why is it like that? It's like that every single winter because we had this bad um fortune to be in the middle of the valley. And we have um, uh, also a combination of uh, more polluters, more than one polluters. This technical equipment doesn't like me. Yeah. Okay. I'll just keep the introductions and just go with I press and I keep it. Okay, I got it. <laughs> Should I keep it more? Maybe the, the batteries are giving up. <laughs> Okay, so what, what we are doing is basically the same. We are um, lobbying for finances. We don't have any, any um, money. We don't have any budget. We are doing the voluntary work. And one of the things like we are, we are being really Balkans here and um, <laughs> we are using every single opportunity that we can um, to raise the money. We are not asking, we are not participating in any projects not from foreign, not from domestic um, uh, donators, whoever wants to give, they can, they can just give it to the, um, to the organization. But one thing was very funny. Um, I was on an interview together with the ministry of, um, uh, the deputy minister of ecology, and we really had a, a, a tough fight. Uh, it was a radio interview, but it was also TV broadcasted and he lost his nerves and he was being really, really rude. And um, luckily for me, uh, that really <laughs> uh, pushed the button towards the public. And um, there is this um, uh, agenda that the government is pushing that if you pay so-and-so money and then you scan the bill, um, it goes on your account and then the government is giving you some VAT uh, back. And one of the people who was watching this interview said, like, I think that nobody really needs this money more than these people fighting with the government. And he said, like, I'm going to donate my money for them. And this is how we start generating money from just ordinary citizens. It's not a lot of money, but it's uh, helpful for a small uh, project that, that, that we like to push. Um, we're putting pressure and we're doing analysis. Uh, we were lacking data as we all do here in the Balkans because um, in Macedonia, we have only like, 20 stations and none of them is working completely like fully uh 
each and every one of them is missing some important tool. So basically you can never get all the data that you need to do the, the, the analysis. And this is how we start doing the civil type of, not calibrated, but um, let's say boxes that will show you trends. This is how we like to call them. And at the moment um, we, we, we have, um, participating in two networks. One of them is maybe here, maybe there. Ah. Yeah, but yeah. I'm going to be very persistent in this. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is, this is, uh, no, I need the back. Yep. <laughs> So this is what we are hosting. This is for Skopje, for example. This was yesterday and it was raining and uh, there was wind. So that's why you see a lot of uh, green uh, uh, on the screen. Uh, otherwise it's really red and orange and sometimes it's even purple. Uh, so this is Pulse Echo that is also part of air care as Alexandra mentioned. And this is what citizens are doing to, to, to gain um, uh, more uh, data. Uh, we're trying to cover at the first all the data was coming from, let's say, richer municipalities in which people can afford to order the, the, the parts and make uh, the boxes by themselves. But later we are financing and we're giving it in the poorer municipalities in order to have um, uh, cover the whole city to, to, to have it covered. Uh, this is something that really is uh, bothering the, uh, the uh, institutions because uh, it's giving... Uh, it's giving the public the, the data and, and it's very visible. Nope. It's very visible when because you have these circles like a green circle and orange circle and red circle. And um, what, we, we, what we did is use the media. For example, I'm a, um, I'm a former journalist that now works in marketing agency and I'm covering the public relations department. So my, my field was to work with my former colleagues in the media. Uh, we have um, uh, scientists, we have biologists, we have uh, uh, geneticists in our uh, organization, we have the IT experts, so we all combine our experience. What we decided is that we're going to make the message towards the public to be more simplified, so that's why the green, red, uh, and purple circles, and this is not working again. <laughs> I think I have to do it from here. So we tried um, everything. I'm just going to skip through through this, just to go to the main polluters, why uh, this uh, picture that you saw of Skopje is uh, terrible um, as it is, because we have the industry that is mostly working during the, the summer period. And sometimes you will see the peak in the data, for example, uh, during the weekends, Saturday towards Sunday, like 2 a.m. and it's non-explicable. Um, during the winter, we have a lot of problem with the heating because we don't have a, a gas pi uh, pipeline. Um, it takes 10 years, like as Samir said, like the world is going slower in Balkan countries. It's not moving in this direction. And one of also the biggest problems that we have is the traffic. We don't have a, a very good public transportation. And in the meantime, we used to have a government that brought um, a law that allowed import of old cars, which means cars that were dumped in Germany, in Austria, and other European countries like driving Euro one or two or three to be imported. So now the number of these imported cars is like between 20 and 25,000. No, no, we tried to put labeling on the, on the cars. So when the, uh, the, the pollution is, is, is rising, those with the red labels will be moved uh, from the traffic and then the yellow, but that never really, um, came into life because nobody wants to play with so such a um, populistic type of measure uh, because 20, 25,000 cars means at least two people who are voting in the family to, to be left without their car, without the transportation. You don't have a public transportation. And with 50,000 people voting against you, you can lose the election. So nobody really in Macedonia, because this is like a half a million, one million and a half country. So 
construction is blooming and um, uh, during the autumn and the, uh, in the spring, we have the illegal dumpsters. They are just about everywhere. And if you are wondering how is this possible, that's possible because we only have two state inspectors, like two. One of them is always sick. That's he, he, he's doing a hazardous job. Uh, yes, and they have to cover. They have to cover holidays. They have to cover um, second shift in the day. They have to cover weekends. Um, so. We, we try to push and to press for more funding uh, for the uh, for the for the state to have more inspectors, but just it's not working because it's just not uh, it's not working into the, in where they want to go. So what we did, we tried everything um, before uh, COVID. Before COVID era, we had uh, protests, and we had around twenty thousand. Uh, people for this protest. It was December 19, 2019. Uh, and that was probably the last, as Alexandra said, opportunity because after COVID, like everything is dead. You cannot take people out on the street. I don't think uh, there is a topic that they would go out. N maybe not even for the sport because we are lousy and bad as well. Uh, so there was a presidential presidential elections we invited the presidential candidates. These are three people that you see here. The one to the to to your right is now the actual president. They all had. Uh, we asked them to have and to see their environmental platform and anti pollution platform. They they were all ready to do so. Just after that, nothing happened. Like uh, it's not up to me. It's always to the parliament. It's always to the who has the majority. We tried some guerrilla for the trees. We 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 spiked some some fire in front of the 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 government and nothing really made um, a big bigger impact except for the media as Samir said as, and this is very important um, we are present in the media like almost probably every single day one of us is in some media and it's like nothing is really happening except yes some somewhere in the back of the mind of the people the awareness is rising, but otherwise within the institution, nothing. So, but when you have BBC or when you have Al Jazeera or when you have El Pai, something is waking me within the institution. Unfortunately, it lasts for a few days, but it's good enough for us to make some changes. So we are now dedicating also for the youngsters, for, for, for children age of 10 to 12, we are publishing some uh, and for their parents, because we decided that we should be concentrated on the new generation, because obviously the older one are not. Um, no, 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 like they are like uh, uh, in a sleep, in a deep sleep. Uh, one of the things that it's working and that we can, after everything we tried, like uh, a, 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 a trial of, of, of mistakes and and. And, and good examples is this one. This is the eco-parliamentary group that we managed to form right after the parliamentary elections. We approached every single one of them, not with emails, not with um, SMS, no. We were waiting for them in front of the parliament, in front of the houses, in front of the universities where they work. Like we divided, like we all had a list of people that we need to contact and we speak to every and each one of them, there are 120 members of the parliament. 40 of them agreed to participate in the group. They gave the written permission and they joined, they joined the, the, the group. It's very funny. We are communicating through, through Viber group with the members of the parliament. And um, one of the, the, pre, uh, the candidates for the uh, president is very, very strong uh, 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 supporter. So what is the, 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 the strong side is that um, we can push for laws, we can push for changes in the law within this group in the parliament. But the weak side is that it, it's never any initiative coming from them. The analysis needs to be done by us. The laws need to be written and rewritten by us and given to them just to, to vote. This is one of the weaknesses. And the other weak side is um, 
that they will agree and they will say, okay, in a Viber group, yeah, yeah, I agree with you. I will vote yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, I will push for this. I will push for the budget and, and so and so. And then they go to the, to the assembly and they vote no. And they will say like, um, uh, I apologize, but I received, you know, like a new, new, new vision from my party. And it was like an order for us to vote no. Uh, even for the, the, the slightest, for the stupidest things. But still, out of these 40 people, at least 30 would, would pass some of the laws. They will talk, they will, they will bring the, the, the laws for the commissions. And we are really leaving the, 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 the hopes for, for, for this uh, group that maybe in the future will be proactive because when they are successful, this is what we are doing. We are, doing, we are going in the media with their names who supported us and they like to 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 see their names in the media so so basically uh, this ego playing is um but you don't do shame uh we do that we do that not in the media but we do on the social media <laughs> uh we are we're we're putting lists like who supported it and who didn't and um sometimes the media is um I, i'm at the end because it's uh, uh quite clear what the future brings um uh, we're, we, we, they like to see their names in the media, where the media, the journalists are used, they're kind of lazy. They don't like to do the analysis by themselves. It's easy if we do the analysis and they just pick it up from us. And they, they treat us like a credible partner who's doing in-depth analysis. And if we are pushing for a law and if we say like these members of the parliament are supporting or not supporting us, they just don't bother to check maybe the, the lists in the parliament. They just pick it up from us and it's in the, in the media. So basically, we're, we're really laying the hopes in the future for having a stronger and wider uh, parliamentary group. Because in this group, there are people from all uh, parties. And also, we are getting more concentrated into, into educating the younger population meaning the higher grades in the elementary and high school students because this is the this is the the population that still has some enthusiasm for a better life so basically that's what we are hoping i i hope i didn't take uh, much time it's technology though thank you very much ellie and thanks to all the presenters i think we heard examples of um, four green Marvel heroes mm -hmm. that fight, like the one from the artificial intelligence. And um, each one has developed a sort of a, a strategy based on the local conditions and local challenges that can be shared and maybe differently applied in other contexts. So I would like to ask the audience if they have any question to put because then to give like two final conclusive minutes for each using your mobile phone like just two minutes mm -hmm. <laughs> and maybe asking to you um what um what would you need in order to reinforce your agency either for your organization in terms of uh, capacities to reinforce to build or infrastructure where you position yourself uh, in your organization because i think also we should look forward on how all the stakeholders i mean can support what you do because we cannot come um, and strike with you but at least i mean this is the session where to uh, ask put these questions and at least uh, collect your requests let's let's put it this way without any expectation of course mm -hmm. but at least we're then going to put it in our paper <laughs> so if if there are questions please Uh, thank you. Uh, very fascinating. Like really, like the the four four heroes here. <laughs> That's a good point. Uh, what I would be interested is um, you were saying about gathering this data, which is a very important uh, part of, of of what you do, and and analyzing it and providing it to the uh, to the MPs. But uh, maybe you can say something about what this data is telling us. So because there is a lot of similar research where you where you see, for example social issues and pollution interrelate there might be 
if I understood it right, also some bias because in, in the data, because some people who can manage or are more interested to measure the, the, the they, they probably live in the better areas and others don't have, you, you work against this, uh, as, as I heard. But are, are there studies from maybe your your, your uh, IT guys or statisticians uh, who who look at this structural data and uh, and tell us a story about maybe deprivation and pollution and and so on. I would be interested in that. Thank you. Thank you. Two more questions, right? Uh, is the answer or is there the no, no, okay. Thank you. I have two questions: one for Alexandra and one for Ali. It's a, like a clarification questions. Alexandra, you insisted that you will not apply for international fund, funds. So could you explain, um, is it because um, the possible mistrust of the citizens towards the professional organizations as uh, we already heard uh, this morning, or is it something else? Uh, maybe better perception from the government towards uh, you, so this kind of mistrust towards the citizens and also towards the government structures. And from Ali, you said that uh, the members of the parliament that uh, refused to support the suggested laws come, uh, actually that these uh, uh, MPs are coming from different parties. So did you um, see that uh, from certain parties uh, you have the majority of those that refuse to support the, the laws. Thank you. So we follow the, the same line. Let's say if you want to start, especially with the data, and please, like two three minutes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, concerning the data, uh, we we are not collecting data on different things that than the environment itself in this particular case on air quality yes the situation is getting a little bit better from year to year like like in Zenitsa, but it is not getting better enough that's that's the problem it is still uh, uh the the limits are uh exceeded uh, et cetera, et cetera. in almost all the places in, in serbia when speaking about serbia and i just wanted to 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 conclude something that came to my mind uh after listening to our to 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 our, my colleagues, uh, you see, uh, because I also have two heads, uh, two heads and two heads, both of them. Uh, since I was working as a civil servant for more than than almost thirty years, uh, we are all saying, okay, we are pushing the the public. The public is pushing the government. Then we are changing the law. We are reaching the media, and then the law is there, and there is a strategy. And then there, ha there has to be some people in the, in the governmental bodies who are going to implement these things. And I'm going to tell you the secret. These people do not exist. There is no more. 20 years ago, there was some people. There were some people. But nowadays, I know the situation in Macedonia. I know the situation in Bosnia less than in Macedonia. I know the situation in Montenegro, in Serbia as well. So these people do not exist. You can pass the law, you can pass the strategy. You can have a media coverage. You can have uh, 100,000 people on the street. You can do whatever you want. They are going to vote for the law. They are going to adopt the law. They are going to adopt the, the program. They are going to adopt the strategy. You, you, you're successful. And then implementation. As I said, EU cannot push Balkan countries to do the implementation. How you, you, you imagine that we are going to push them? Why? Why is it even if they want to do it, they cannot do it because the capacity of the governmental bodies disappeared during the last 20 years. It disappeared physically. People got retired. New people did not have the same capacity or for some unbelievably simple reason that I'm not going to say the new people were not ready to learn to, to be part of the team. They were expecting results tomorrow morning. The, the life is not about tomorrow morning. The life is all about the life. Tomorrow, nobody of us will be rich tomorrow morning. Nobody of us will be something different tomorrow morning. And one, one day, if we manage to understand this, that nothing will, uh, uh, will happen tomorrow morning, except that we are going to wake up in another day, we are going to do things in a better way. Thank you. 
just briefly about the data. Um, um, I want to stress that none of us in Ecostraja is an expert. We only only one person is actually, I think, has a degree in forestry. But we're not experts, but people who wanted to learn to, to uh, get to the information, to understand information. And um, pretty fair number of us are analysts in certain way. And we have learned a lot so far. So we are capable of understanding the matter. And vis-a-vis uh, -vis, um, air pollution in Serbia, the biggest issue uh, and something that is being uh, um, object of measuring uh, is related to these uh, suspended particles, these small particles uh, in the air, because um, some very poisonous uh, toxic substance substances that uh, are result of uh, burning of uh, plastic, uh, dioxin and uh, furan, there are no facilities in the entire state measuring that which is incredible, but it is so. So we are focusing on these small particles. We are following those data and everything is revolving around that. Uh, some places also have issues with some poisonous gases like uh, uh, sulfur dioxide, et cetera. But uh, these are, you know, um, isolated, isolated spots. And why am I uh, mentioning that we have learned uh, to analyze and to uh, interpret data? Uh, people are trying to understand how different micro locations uh, do in terms of air pollution. And uh, people change these uh, small devices around. They are trying to you know, now we understand that humidity is important. Now we understand that the temperature is important. Now we understand all these factors that uh, impact uh, the results uh, in terms of pollution are important. So um, we also read quite uh, uh, voluminous uh, um, part of literature, uh, uh, serious academic literature, who, who was actually dealing with evaluation of results of this official calibrated measuring stations and these small cheap uh, civic sensors, you know, how reliable data are. And actually, you know, um, 10 to 15% is the difference. But when you have pollution, which is like 20 times uh, above the, 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 the border level uh, that is, um, written in the law, then it's really not important that your measurement is 10 or 15% making an error because obviously the air is polluted. So just that, thank you. I tried to answer the question what we need. Uh, we need in the civil society and also in the in the institutions, because it's not the, the role of, of civil society to replace the institutions. Uh, we want to make them do their job. And they don't have the capacity. And then we need, uh, and also my colleague said that we are old. We are old. Uh, our organization also, uh, our our average age, age our, our average age. experience, experience. <laughs> Average age is above 50 and we need young people and we don't know how to attract young people because they are impatient. They cannot wait for, for ages, for years to, to, to see the results. And we need uh, know how, how to engage young people. There is an Italian philosopher, Umberto Galimberti, and he wrote the book called Disturbing Guest, uh, Nihilism and the Youth. And he tried to explain uh, why young people have nihilism. They, they, they just don't want to solve the problems, they want to avoid them. And this is the change that we need. And we don't know how to do it. And this is the know-how. We learned all about the air pollution, the PM10, PM2.5, about the dioxins, about the persistent organic pollutants, everything. But we don't know how to engage the young people. And this is all about them because they are the future. And uh, we, uh, we have to do more uh, to explain them that they have to engage more because it's, it's for them, it's not for us. Thank you.
I absolutely agree with you that the, the, the new generations are our are, are primarily target in the future. Um, I will answer the second question first. Um, I have it here as data that we are existing from 2016. And from 2016 till 2023, we had four governments, pardon, five. We had the new one yesterday. Five governments and three prime ministers. Those who are always against any changes are the ruling coalitions, always. Even if they switch the places, and the opposition becomes the government and the government goes, like the actual government goes to opposition, those who are in the government are always opposing on the laws because it brings them more responsibility and it takes money from the budget. They don't want to give money from the budget for the environmental issues. We are collecting in, in Macedonia, we are collecting between uh, 230 and 250 million euros per year because of environmental taxes. And not 1% of this money are going into environment. It's going into administration, into salaries, into pensions, into covering debts, and so on and so on. Um, regarding the data analysis, the first question, we do have people who are doing the, such an um, analysis, and we're doing it by the end of each month. And um, we were discussing yesterday about, uh, about this. Uh, when we are... When we are um, uh, bringing both uh, uh, data from the government uh, station and from the civic sensors, there are like 10% difference, but there are certain areas in the, in the country that don't have governmental sensors. And civil sensors are showing, for example, there is a city in Eastern Macedonia that is called Berov, it's up in the mountain, doesn't have industry, like it should be clean air, no question asked. Two months in a row, we made, we made the analysis that they didn't have a single day of clean air, one single day. And we, of course, we went with this uh, data to the media and the mayor of Berovo called very angry, like, why are you saying this? You're destroying, because there are some spas there, some hotels, like you're destroying tourism and, and uh, economy and so and so. But when we went there, we figured it out that people used to, they used to heat, to use for, for a heating during winter, they used to uh, have wood. But now, because of the government is talking like, now you have to be very careful because of the energetic crisis, they started to resell the wood and they started using coil. And there you go. So um, you cannot they cannot be like 100% precise analysis, but they surely can, can show trends of pollution. Thank you very much. Okay, just one, 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 one minute because we have the conclusions there. The idea is to become self-aware and to become active. We really ha have to stop to rely on savior, you know, a Batman or a Superman that will come and save us. We really have to figure out how to create a better life by ourselves. And uh, environment is a fantastic field in which everything that is going on in the society is reflected. Why we have to be very careful about uh, uh, the regulations that are uh, uh, um, focusing uh, environmental protection, because ultimately it is all about stability of social order, because if infringers of norms are not being punished, then the uh, um, um, trust in uh, um, those kind of norms is simply disappearing. And you know we really have uh, unstable situ situation at the end. So it's really very much related to uh, how the society functions. You know that's why our environment arguably is uh, uh, the 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 hottest topic uh, of politics in future. Similarly, like the noise as a phenomenon is uh, the ultimate uh, uh, place showing uh, the issues related to uh, spatial justice. This is the same as the environment and social order together. So it really 
makes sense to have more focus on it. And as far as uh, policy, you know, environmental protection costs, but uh, um, cost effectiveness of investments into environment are ultimately clearly demonstrating that uh, it makes more sense to invest in that costly environment protection because different kind of costs that we have to pay that we cannot uh, avoid, including social costs, but health costs, you know, lost lives and everything are so much higher. I mean, life costs as, uh, by itself. So thank you. Thank you, Alexandra, for being like that synthetic. So we um, we asked Chiara Milan that she's um, participating from remote. Exactly. Hello, Chiara. Uh, if you can like take five minutes because people here like are quite tired, and then we have the um, the lunch waiting for us. So for you, the very the challenging task to conclude. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. To everybody, it was an amazing event. So first of all, I would like to thank the organizers of the event. Uh, first of all, the, Dr. Pesic, because she was the one organizing everything and putting together uh, the panel of uh, this amazing pool of experts, academics, policymakers, and activists. I also would like to thank the University of Belgrade for hosting us and the team of Observatorio Balcani and Caucaso for the organization and the contribution to the event and especially Luisa Chiodi, who first launched this idea of the network and uh, worked hard uh, uh, to put this project together. Uh, today, it was uh, our first policy event, uh, and the idea was to present uh, the policy paper written by the team of Belgrade and also to, I mean, the policy paper provided uh, food for thought. And I can see, I could see from uh, here that the discussion was really enriching and provided a lot of point for discussions. Um, we saw that uh, these, um, the topic of environment uh, is a hot topic. It is uh, very much present uh, in the civil society, not only in Serbia, but uh, all over Europe, and it is particularly a press pressuring issue uh, in the region. Personally, I've been following uh, the development of uh, civic activism in Bosnia and Herzegovina in the last 10 years, and I've been also following uh, uh, the emergence of uh, grassroots activism in Serbia and in the region. And uh, building a bit upon the findings of the policy paper, my own research, and the points that have been raised um, and the discussion today from uh, all the activists uh, that intervene, the uh, policymakers and academics. And again, I would like to thank them all for the time they devoted to our event. Well, I would like just to stress a few, um, few points that can um, provide additional food for thought on which we can keep reflecting both uh, in our network uh, that uh, are um, presented perfectly, but also amongst uh, the um, wider public. So as we said, uh, the, in an attempt to wrap up today's discussion, uh, I, I noted, uh, I brought down three points. Uh, the first is that uh, uh, how it, uh, and that it emerges also from uh, the policy paper written by Dr. Pesic and Dr. Bukelic is how environmental uh, issues are becoming importantly, um, not only because they are a pressing issue all over Europe, all over the world, but also because uh, mm, they represent the condition for the accession of Serbia and the other Balkan countries that are not part of the European Union yet. Uh, they represent a precondition, uh, the environmental chapter is a precondition for the accession to the European Union. Uh, so this need for legal harmonization that has been stressed today uh, provided uh, opportunities both for domestic governments, but also for uh, uh, NGOs and grassroots groups that uh, are um, trying to gain some leverage towards uh, their own government. So um, it, it is important how the environment uh, represented a unifying, unifying element um, for different groups of working uh, on the issue um, of the environment. And actually the process of European integration provided more um, opportunities and also more instruments for civil society groups to, uh, as a said, gain more leverage towards their own government. Um, also, it's important to notice how um, 
the meaning of political change over time. So uh, for years, and I think again, this emerged from the discussion today, but also from policy papers, um, for years, the um, word uh, political was uh, a controversial one and was rarely used uh, from uh, grassroots activists. But now there is a sort of resignification of uh, um, what it means to be political. So it's happening, for instance, uh, with the Nedavimo Belgrad movement, and today uh, it was explained uh, by a member of uh, Nedavimo Belgrad how um, political became an important word uh, and also was uh, gaining uh, attraction towards uh, uh, hopefully the younger population, but for sure amongst the wider public. Uh, the political trajectory uh, that led groups uh, to enter the national parliament, for instance, are the embodiment of this resignification of the political. Uh, so we are um, a step further from these uh, um, politics of the anti-politics, as it was called before. So the professionalization of NGOs that to a certain extent refuse to define their uh, action as political, to uh, a protagonism of the grassroots uh, that resignify this word of political, um, depriving it of this negative meaning and trying to um, show the side of uh, uh, the important side of doing a political work uh, that that is also that of entering the institutions that can be summarized uh, with the words uh, of Robert Cosma or keeping one foot on the streets and one of the institutions. And it's something that emerged also from this uh, round table on the importance of trying to enter the institution and the institution and to interact uh, uh, with uh, um, political parties if needed. Finally, uh, just my 50 cent on the democratization process uh, that is divorced from the EU and this sort of disenchantment towards the enlargement process. Um, here, I would like to refer to Serbia in particular. But this can be um, that can be said also from Montenegro. So we are witnessing an opposite trend. So on the one end, uh, we can see that countries such as Serbia and Montenegro face a democratic backsliding. So they are not uh, improving in uh, uh, the level of democratization. But on the other hand, we witness the opposite for uh, civil society activism. That that on the other side, it is thriving. And it is more and more um, able to, um, to gain wider support from the population, from the public, but also, uh, and also adopting means such as taking to the streets, organizing protests, uh, and uh, um, also transnationalizing uh, uh, their efforts by connecting with other groups uh, um, all over the country, but also all over the region as the panel today demonstrated. So to conclude, uh, drawing upon the, the, pay, the policy paper that was presented, uh, we can say that uh, really the European Union uh, is uh, represents a frenemy. So uh, as uh, Yelena and Elisabetta put it uh, uh, in a funny but uh, very um, um, coherent way. So a friends and enemy at the same time. So the European Union can be used, can be a tool um, to uh, for civil society organizations to enforce changes and at the same time can offer opportunities uh, uh, to gain some leverage towards domestic governments while on the other hand uh, um, another point that emerged today is that uh, uh, the civil society organizations alone cannot uh, uh, really implement the changes that are due by national governments that in certain cases such uh, um, the situation we're witnessing nowadays, they cannot be defined as allies of the civil society organizations. So on this note, uh, I would like to conclude. Our academic work continues. We will um, once again uh, thank all those persons who participated into the project, the research uh, who presented their activities, and also that continue to keep uh, this dialogue uh, with uh, with us, I mean, from the academic side, because I think this is really uh, a great, great opportunity that to be in constant dialogue uh, between civil society actors, um, people on the academic side and policymakers. So once again, thank everybody for participating and thanks uh, the organizers for the efforts. And uh, I wish you a well-deserved lunch and rest afterwards.
Thank you, everybody, even from home, from Zoom. So see you next time. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks. Mm -hmm.